at uh, 633, uh, the um, Montpelier Roxbury Board of School Directors. Uh, thanks everyone for coming out. We've got a short agenda, but uh, obviously a lot to talk about and some big decisions to be made. I just want to preface this by uh, at the end of, of this process, when we send something else to the voters, uh, or a second vote to the voters, likely uh, next Wednesday, the 20th, um, I think it's going to involve choices that no one wants. Uh, none of the options are good. All of the options involve uh, you know, someone uh, getting something likely taken away from them that is valuable and uh, that th they feel is needed. If not, it would not have been in the budget in the first place. Uh, so I just want to acknowledge that the choice before us is, is tough. Uh, this is something we have to do, not, I think, something everybody wants to do. Um, and uh, we really uh, appreciate uh, the engagement uh, and the input as we try to make a decision on a, a timeline uh, and with a, with a process that I don't think anyone in this room thinks is going to be ideal. Um, so we have uh, public comment. We're going to open with public comment. Uh, we're then going to get a budget presentation. We're then going to have a second public comment um, to get some response to the budget presentation. I want to give I do not want to police time much, but I would appreciate if you policed your own time and are respectful that there's a lot of people in the room, a lot of people who want to who want to talk. So uh, I will not time it, but I'll ask you to please keep your remarks to around a minute if that is possible. Um, you know, you can certainly reference things that have been said before by saying you agree with someone rather than repeating what they say. Uh, it's one good way to shorten it. Um, uh, but if you could please do that, that would, uh, I think, move things along and give everyone a chance to feel like they've both given input this evening uh, and then we don't drag to a place where, where people are uh, kind of too tired to, to listen and absorb uh, input. Um, so uh, let's just start with public comment initially in the room. Re remember, you will have a second opportunity after the budget presentation uh, to, to give comments. So if you, uh, you can speak twice, uh, you know, if you want to wait and see what some of the proposals and options are and speak to them, uh, you know, and, and, and hold off at first, that's fine too. But, uh, we're, you know, you're, you're welcome to speak twice. Uh, but if you don't speak now, you will have a second opportunity, uh, to respond to the presentation Libby is going to give. Uh, so with that, I'm just going to open up in the room. Uh, if people just want to come up one at a time, please introduce yourself. Uh, and then again, uh, I will not time it, but if it, if you could try to keep it to a minute, that would be great. I will say if someone goes on and on and on, I may try to uh, encourage them to wind up at some point. Um, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to time time the comments because we do want to get uh, as much as much of what you have to say uh, in the record and before us as possible. Uh, so whoever wants to go first, uh, please do. Um, and we'll just uh, wait until the room is, is exhausted. And if people online could just uh, hit their raise hand function so we can get a sense of who wants to say something online, uh, please do that either now or when you feel inspired. Yes. Um, my name is Hannah Bryant. I am the parent of a third grader here at RVS and a fifth grader at MSMS. I sadly recognize that the demographic and budget trends making, make closing Roxbury Village School feel inevitable. However, the push to close the school at the end of this school year, only three months away, is short-sighted and rushed. Proceeding without a thoughtful plan in place, without solid budget numbers, and without sufficient time for families and students to prepare for the change is likely to lead to long-term costs, learning loss, and further enrollment declines. The district owes its teachers, the voters, and Roxbury families a longer runway leading to this major change. Voters deserve to understand both the cost savings and the new expenses associated with closing the school and adding its children into UES. It's misleading for voters to assume that all costs associated with this school will be subtracted from the budget and that there will not be any new costs to ensure equitable opportunities are provided for all our kids. Roxbury families need time to plan for the school closure. 
Families here have built our lives around this school, its on-site childcare, and the network of neighbors we interact with every day at these front doors. Not all families here have cars. That not all families have flexible jobs or resources to adapt to these unforeseen expenses associated with moving the school 25 miles north. Our most vulnerable families are least able to quickly adapt to the closure of this school. Most importantly, our kids need time to plan for this transition. Many of these kids already had their early school years interrupted with COVID closures. They are catching up socially and academically, but another major disruption can derail this progress, particularly if a rushed school closure causes major stress at their, in their homes and families. As parents and educators, we model empathy and equity as we guide our kids to be thoughtful in their actions and decisions, to consider the consequences before acting, we guide them to weigh pros and cons. We owe it to them to demonstrate the same careful judgment, consideration of consequences, and planning for such a major change that will dramatically impact their lives. We only get one chance to do this school closure and do it right. Please partner with us to keep the Roxbury Village School open for one more school year as we work together to prepare for a graceful closure of the school and to welcome Roxbury's youngest children into UES. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, Hello, my name is Mike French. I attended this school when it was a two room schoolhouse. Um, Back in the 80s, I think we had a population of 80 students that required expanding the school. We did a huge bond vote, the biggest expense this town's ever had, to build this school to make it what it was. Um, staff reductions are reversible. Mothballing a school is not. What student enrollment figure makes the Roxbury School viable? This town paid dearly in the 80s to make this school happen. 60 kids, 80 kids, what makes this building in this facility worth keeping versus not keeping? One of the huge challenges we had in the 80s was the population was all over the place. We had one year a family of 10 students move in. That was like a 20% increase. Then we had a foster family come in and increase the students there. So the two teachers we had and the two uh, student teachers was the entire staff here. I now look and understand because of requirements, we have other positions, admin positions, probably per regulations, and there's like a dozen cars that are parked out here in the parking lot. But still, somebody has hopefully done studies to say, what's the population that makes a local small town school viable? Um, I haven't, I haven't, I'm new to this, and I haven't been following what's going on, but you know, that seems like a question that needs to be answered. Uh, when the town was smaller, we had a dozen small schools, and that was managed by closing up one part of the school or adding another school building. Um, I'm talking, you know, 100 years ago. Um, what is the net per student tuition savings that we will see by closing this school across the entire population? I expect it's negligible on a per student population basis. Do we lose our town school to save something like $100 per student? In Roxbury, this is the heart of the town. I'm on the planning commission. We're trying to revitalize the town. We're trying to bring businesses. We're trying to bring families. We're trying to increase the tax base of the town by having people move here. Who wants to move to a town without a school? Who wants to transport their students? 90 minutes or however long it takes. Because I remember being on the Roxbury school bus for 90 minutes every day as a student. So we had to travel through Roxbury, go up on the back roads, go over to East Roxbury, go to Northfield. And then if you were in the vocational program, you got bus down to Randolph, then back to Northfield, then back on a bus. It's like too big a chunk of changes spent just riding the bus, which wasn't always the best experience. Again, who wants to move to this town? What will it do to the tax base of the town if nobody wants to move here? Nobody with a family wants to move here. 
you know, they're going to be that far separated from any student or club activities if they have to go to Montpelier. Basically, Roxbury students will be disenfranchised because they won't be able to partake as easily as folks in Northfield. So I've listed a few questions. You can replay the tape. If anyone has insight now, I'd like to hear what do we save by mothballing this facility? And as the previous lady mentioned, there are costs to mothballing a facility. I'm not even sure this town would know what to do with this building or what it would do to our tax base to have to maintain this building. Because if you close this school, you're shifting the burden of maintaining this school and this physical building from the school budget back onto the taxpayers in an ever shrinking tax base because nobody's gonna to wanna to move here. We're trying to grow the town. Most towns are trying to grow or not lose. We have the same number of roads to maintain as the town of Northfield. We have the same physical you know, square mileage, square footage, square acres. That all has to come out of a tax base. And if we don't get folks moving into town, then we're gonna have less roads to even keep our, or less money to even keep our roads open. You know, to say nothing about paying tuition to some other school, which is probably not going to go down. I project that if we look at the tuition basis, tuition dollars from Roxbury over the next 10 years, what are we going to see for our savings on a per student basis? I think that's about mostly what I needed to say. But again, I'm coming to this late and I haven't been following things, but just some basic questions. I do, I'm not a big fan of consolidation and mergers. I've seen it in corporate world. And what you get is higher paid CEOs and folks wanting to build big buildings with glass fronts and put them, pat themselves on the shoulder and get bigger salaries because they're managing more people. I don't see lower budgets when things get bigger. I don't see those savings realized. I'm not sure if any of the other towns that have been shut down, like Rochester, if they have seen a savings. My guess is their tuition has got, done nothing but keep going up. So I yield the floor. Great. Thank you. If you sit at the table it there, and again, please, oh. please introduce yeah, yeah. It doesn't yeah. work. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, it just is for that. There. Okay. Oh, um, here's my voice. Okay. Um, I don't mean to compare the proposed dissolution of the school with the banning of books, which is becoming more prevalent among some red states. But I do think they have one thing in common. And that's the blocking of vital educational pathways for vulnerable children. And it makes me sad. Sorry, oh, I'm Claire Ch Chomantowski. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> Brian Zajac, nice to see everybody tonight. So I just want to start off by saying I'm sure you've heard a couple already tonight. You probably hear some more behind me as well. And over the last few months, you've probably heard a lot of impassioned speeches and pleas to don't do this, don't do that. I just want to acknowledge the Montpelier community. Roxbury's rabid support for this elementary school has nothing to do with the fact that we're dismissing the tax spike you got hit with this year. Like I said, we understand that. We've had our fair share of very high tax rates for many years as well. And this push is by no means an ask for the Montpelier community to carry Roxbury's burden. We pay our taxes the same, we make the same decisions, we're all here in the same boat together. Um, in terms of content, what I would like to share, you know, over the years I could tell you this way, that way, how this school, our merger has cost the Montpelier community nothing. But I can also say that in the world of Act 127, you know, the numbers have changed a lot. You know, would the school, would the school necessarily cost the community anything? No. But it is an expensive school. We cannot deny that. I would argue the board, the administration, would largely be negligent not to consider big decisions like you are faced with. But I can say 
we've known about Act 127 for a long time. You know, this board, our school district, has done a really good job of engaging the community, working very thoughtfully and very methodically about doing things right. The way everything is unfolding right now with the potential Roxbury Village school closure has not been methodical, has not been thoughtful, has not been planned out well. I, I'll beg you to really give this the effort and the time that it needs to do it well, to do it right. There's a lot of assets, there are a lot of opportunities in front of us to go forward well, but I can honestly say like we are not heading that path right now. We need time and we need some really thoughtful joint discussions to be able to really move it forward in a way that's going to be good for everybody. So I just ask you to follow the path that you've gone on before, the district making really good decisions with lots of really good input from all the stakeholders. So I'd hope that the budget discussions and the big decisions we will be faced with go that direction. As always, thank you all for your service. guys should know, so it's Jacqueline Frazier. We've spoken briefly before, and I'm sure you'll hear from my illustrious father later. Um, uh, I was the first kindergartner class in this school, and I also was part of this particular room when it was K through 3, I want to say, on this side, and 4 through 6 on this side. So we had the whole school in this one room at this point. Um, my parents own a greenhouse business across the street. I live up the street. I've got two kids in the school and a parents, you know, my parents' business. We even get our water from this school. So to be honest, like there's no more ways we could be tied to the school. Uh, we all see in, inevitably the writing on the wall. Nobody's really looking at this as being a, a, a potential existing school for the next 10 years. I think there's a lot of reality being passed around between us and amongst us. And by the way, you should know that we've all organized before coming here in, in a way that we can speak educatedly to this subject so that we don't just go on various diatribes. The ask is that it's done in a way that's really executed clearly so that we don't have a lot of uncertainty. For example, when I relocated to this uh, to Vermont, I did not plan to live in Roxbury. I mean, I can avidly say I was not keen to live here. Uh, I was focused on Montpelier, and um, I I was not able to find a home. And then I landed in Roxbury. Um, you know, sidebar, Kristen Gettler can speak to the fact I did not give her my number. I did not want to be in this town. <laughs> she asked me for my number, and I was like, you know, no, I'm I'm gonna I'm not gonna be here long. Well, I am here, and I've landed here, and I've been very 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 shocked. That how, at how wonderful it is. What we're looking at in the future, and here's the ask, is give us the year, right? And if you can't get your constituents to agree to a year, then we want to utilize this building in either after school care for the students coming back from RVS, I mean from uh, MRPS, or for summer programs. We want to try find a way for this school to remain within the Montpelier district for the next year because this, the, the town is not ready to decide what's going to happen to the building. We want a thoughtful process as to what we can do with this building moving forward, pending a year extension. We all know that a 24% increase is hard to swallow. I have former Roxbury graduates in Montpelier who cannot afford that increase. And we also know 30% of budgets failed, right? So it has nothing to do with the school board. It's everything to do with the legislature. That doesn't mean that we don't have a way to present this to the community. Um, I think the, Roxbury, Rox, I'm sorry, the Montpelier community could absorb a 16% increase, maybe not 10 Either way, we're going to defer to your decision-making process on this. I do feel we're lucky to have the Montpelier board here versus the Barry board or some of the other boards that are really dysfunctional across the state. At least we're not, you know, doing point of orders every two seconds. So I really am going to trust that you guys have our best interests here. But the ask is to think about this building, think about how we can keep our kids together. And the last thing I'm going to mention is busing, which I know that nobody wants to talk about. It matters. It matters a lot because the busing is a fucking problem. I mean, I don't know how else to put it. And I mean, that's on camera. It's a problem. So we've got 45-minute late buses for kids waiting out at 6 or 5 in the morning to go on an hour-and-a-half bus ride. It needs to be fixed. Yeah, so thanks for my time. I'll yield. You up, Dad? A second comment period. So, hey guys, uh, Nick Leskovsky. Um, I am the father of a uh, third grader and uh, also the president of uh, the Roxbury Community Trust, which is the neighboring 
church slash wood shop. Um, I don't think I have too much more to say other than we just need the timeline to make sure that this is not going to be a gaping hole of a building in the community. Um, we uh, had a group of folks recently come together to purchase the church as a way to save it, um, to help our downtown improve what this place looks like and how it's going to grow into the future. A big part of that is the school being what it is right now, um, particularly with the activity that it um, has here. And uh, to think about this place being really quiet is tough. It's a really tough pill to swallow. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I just want to say that we have uh, um, a lot of people here that are invested in making this downtown a um, vibrant place, and we just need more time to think about how um, this decision is going to evolve um, for the next two, three, ten years. So that's it. Thank you. Hi there. <clears throat> My name is Christine Dorman. I have uh, two children in the Roxbury School, and I'm not the best at public speaking, so I'm a little nervous. Um, my son, Amos, is uh, six years old. He has um, nonverbal autism, and this, <laughs> I understand that this will, will have to close, I get that, but um, he has made so much progress here, having like such a small school, and having, um, just like the whole community cares about him and looks out for him and um, I just worry about having such a drastic change so quickly for him and it's very selfish I know but he's made so much progress and I just really hope that you could give us another year just to just to ease him into it and ease all these kids who love being with each other and like that's the best part is that they're just such a tight-knit group of kids together and I know they'll thrive and do wonderful at Montpelier, and it's a beautiful school there. And I have toured there, looked at it, and seen it, and I think it has such great opportunities for these kids too, but I just hope we really do consider why we all moved here. A lot of us chose to come here for the small school for the rural part of Vermont. And if we could just, just keep that in consideration and how we move forward. Thank you. in the room um online we've got at least one person um chad hello oh, yep we can hear you okay great uh, hold on one second getting a echo um thank you all um I first want to start off by saying thank you for all the work that you all have done. Um, it's a tremendous amount of effort went into building that budget. And I just want to uh, commend you all for the thoughtful, meticulous work that you've done. Um, I think the second thing I wanted to just say is um, similar. I'm going to uh, actually echo a lot of what's been said already. Um, so I guess a couple of questions just asking about um, if work has been done with um, in in context of all the work that you've already done to think about the impact of any cuts um, 10 years down the road. And are we actually going to see savings um, in a dollar figure amount? Um, our family, we just bought a house here in, in Montpelier. We've been here for almost five years. Um, we can't really afford this house anymore, but I voted for the, the budget. And I did so because I think this, though I believe in the work that you all did um, and are doing. And um, I also think that this is an equitable budget. 
I think it um, it really puts the needs of uh, learners and families um, who uh, who who need the most amount of of support and educational and academic support first. Um, and I'm I've actually been really moved by the comments made so far. So I hope we are considering that. And my question is. Um, in in um, in particular for folks who are on the equity committee, if there's been conversations around the equitable impact or the negative impact on on uh, families and learners, um, and uh, what that might look like in years two, three, four, and so on. I guess my last uh, point is more of a comment. Um, and I, I made this comment when we were talking about our facilities um, in Montpelier um, and thinking about the things that we need to consider in a, um, kind of a cl our climate realities um, and thinking about the fact that this just isn't Act 127. It's not about the impact of property taxes. Um, and I hope we can find ways as a district, as a state, um, to communicate um, on more of a national level um, and I'm being a little tongue in cheek here, but we do have the most popular governor in the state, or I'm sorry, in the country, um, who happens to have an R next to his name, like most governors in the country. And I'm wondering if we can focus our energy and our advocacy towards national conversations around investing in our education systems that um, that are required. Uh, we need to we need to have a national conversation, um, and it's unfair for states like. Vermont to um, to carry the burden um, of the the educational expenses that are required. So again, I thank you all. I hope that we'll have um, some answers to the impact of these cuts um, on out years. And thank you again. Chat. We have uh, Cheryl. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank Hi. You. Hi, I'm a Montpelier resident. I'm also a teacher at Callis Elementary. And my son has been in school in Montpelier since kindergarten, and he's now in 10th grade. And I have to say, listening to the Roxbury people speak, and I had we had moved here from Craftsbury, so I know what it's like to live in a small town, and I know how important that small school is to everybody. And they have a lot of good points. It's a vital part of their community and they are trying to build so that people will move there. And the New York Times and many other um, newspapers around our country are actually reporting that Vermont will be one of the number one places to move to because of global climate change. So we have to start thinking more forward. We need to start building more houses so people can move here because people want to move here. At my small school in, in Calais, we already have probably like 10 or 12 kids who have moved here in the last few years from California, from the West Coast, from other parts of our country. It is happening and we need to start thinking ahead. And I know that this, the tax burden is huge, but I just think if we don't start being more forward thinking, it's going to hurt us in the long run. And people want to move here. We've got to think of another way to do this. And the voters turnout was very low. And so I don't feel like all of our voices were heard at this last vote. And I totally agree with the Roxbury people when they say we need to wait. We cannot rush this kind of decision. This is way too painful for that community and those children. And this is not how Montpelier rolls. We are not these people that will rush to a decision that will hurt so many others. This is why I live here. This is a really kind, compassionate community. So please, I really urge us to come to another way and to also work together, as the last speaker was saying, to find another way to help fund education because we can't just put it all on our property taxes. There's other ways and we need to make that change now too. And I'm, it's gonna be hard for us for a few years, but it's gonna be really unfair to this small community. So please, please, please think with your hearts and not with your wallets. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you, everyone. I uh, really appreciate uh, <coughs> the very thoughtful words. Um, 
Do we need the presentation? Yeah. Turn over to you. Let Christina get set up. So as, as Christine is getting set up, I'm sure the board and everybody in the room and on Zoom can understand how hard this has been on our team over the last couple days, weighing decisions. Um, and so the way that I've set this up is to give just a little background context, um, some information for the board to consider. We have not put, just for the board's understanding, we've not put more fund balance than what was presented last time to you in these scenarios because we don't have the authorization really to do that. That's the board needs to give us that authorization. So without without that, well, that's not in here. That's not to say the board can't. I'm going to give you information about the fund balance so the board can decide and have that discussion. But just know that I wouldn't do that without board authorization first. Does that make sense? Um, okay. So Vanna otherwise known as Christina, our wonderful business manager, back from Florida where she relaxed for a week. Go ahead. Excuse me for a second. Could you guys introduce yourselves a little bit? I don't, maybe I'm the only one. I don't really know who's got a whole crew up there. Yeah. Could you do that? Turn on the microphone. There's no microphone. There's no microphone. We can definitely do quick introductions. Um, I will start. I'm, I'm Jim Murphy. I'm, I'm the board chair. I'm a Mop Pillier representative. And I want to go Kristen, Rhett, and then skip to Olivia and go down. Kristen Gettler. I'm a Roxbury resident. I am the newly minted secretary of the board, and I serve on the equity committee um, as well as the facilities and energy committee. And I've got a uh, third grader here at RBS. I'm Rhett Williams. I'm part of the board on a bunch of committees, some of them not fully formed yet, including the future of RBS committee, which <clears throat> will be important no matter which way these things go. Um, I don't think people can hear you guys that well. <clears throat> My name's Rhett Williams. I'm from Roxbury. <laughs> I'm on a lot of different committees, including of the future of RBS committee, which is going to be important no matter what happens here. And I have two kids in the second grade. Yeah, no, and I will add, I have three kids, one at MSMS, two at the high school. And he's Jim. And I'm Jim. I said that earlier. <laughs> uh, I'm Libby. I'm, I'm Libby Bonesy. I'm the superintendent of schools. <clears throat> I'm Jill Remick. I'm one of the Montpelier um, representatives, and I have a kiddo at the high school. Scott Lewins, I am a board member, and I've got a kid at UES and a kid at MSMS. Hi, everyone. I'm Mia Moore. I am a Montpelier representative. I also am not very good at public speaking. Uh, <laughs> and I have three kids. That was the part that was hard to get out, Morgan. <laughs> I have three kids, one at MSMS and two at UES. Uh, Jake Feldman, uh, Montpelier School Board. I have one kid at Union Elementary. I'm Miriam Sorota Winston. I'm a student representative and I go to Montpelier High. I'm Laura Cohn. I'm a senior at Montpelier High School, student rep. I have zero kids in <laughs> <laughs> either schools. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm Lynn Turcott. I'm a Montpelier representative, and uh, I have a couple of grandkids in the high school in Montpelier. I'm Tim Duggan. I'm a representative from Montpelier. I have uh, one child at MSMS and one at UES. Okay, so we have some revised budget <coughs> scenarios for the board to consider today. And that is Christina, our amazing business manager. Yeah, Christina. Yes. <laughs> Um, so we are assuming in these tax rate increases, hold on, um, a $10,000 dollar yield, which was, which is a part of the education fund, um, formula. Right now, my man Jake says that the dollar yield is $9,785. With um, all the school budgets that went down, we anticipate the dollar yield going up. 
uh, but there's no way in this budget climate climate for us to really anticipate just how far it will go up. Um, Jake works in the Joint Fiscal Office. That's why I rely on him for this, and they, they calculate that number. It's eventually voted by the legislature at the end of the legislative session, not until May, so we won't know that figure for quite a long, long time. The dollar yield, though, for those who haven't followed these, Budget conversations has a tremendous impact on what the ultimate tax rate is. So the the basic the most basic way to think about it is if the dollar yield goes up, our tax rates go down. If the dollar yield goes down, our tax rates go up. So we all want the dollar yield to go up. So if anybody is inclined to write to our legislatures, that is a good line to use. Get more revenue into the ed fund to make the dollar yield go up. That is good language to use. Because um, that is helpful to all of our tax rates across the state. Uh, our FY24 general budget, which is the budget we are currently acting in, this is just information for the board as a reference point, was 20 or is $28,608,500. The failed FY25 proposed general budget that just went down was proposed to be $32,046,114. From that number, from that 32 million number, in order to get a 1% decrease in our tax rate, that means we have to decrease the failed budget by $206,500. So for every $206,500 we can find to decrease our budget, that decreases the tax rate 1%. So a 10% increase from the FY24 general budget that $28 million number, we need to decrease from our failed budget by $2,263,114. And so the board at the last meeting last Wednesday gave me the range from 10 to 14% tax increase from the FY24 budget. So you can see the numbers that are associated with each one of those. That's what that means. So for a 14% increase from our, from our fiscal year 24 general budget, we need to decrease the failed budget by $1,437,000, essentially. Um, I will tell everybody, as if this is just pointing to the obvious, these are hard numbers to get to. This, these, this is a, I've never had to cut budgets in this way. I don't know many people who have. This is not easy to come by, this, these types of numbers. So Christina, you can keep going. This is just a refresher. Sorry, I'm trying to speak really loud, so if my voice cracks, that's why. Um, <laughs> I haven't used my teacher voice in quite a long time. Just a refresher, this was in the one of the first budget um, presentations for the board. You've seen this chart before. It's based on the 32 million number that failed, but these categories and percentages really don't change a whole lot from year to year. So um, it's just an idea of where what categories do we actually spend on inside of our budget? And then we're going to take a deeper look, a deeper dive into the salaries and benefits part of this pie chart, which I know those, well, actually, it's pretty big on the, on the board there. <laughs> um, the salaries and benefits is 75% of our budget. So we're going to dig into that a little bit. The reason being is because I gave a survey to our staff around this. We've gotten a tremendous amount of input from community members and one theme that we hear is, is uh, cut administration, cut central office staff, cut, cut these positions. Um, and I think it's really important to note how those salaries and benefits sugar out. Um, so our instructional assistants are 10% of that final number. Our teachers are about 70%. Our central office non-licensed staff, so like our payroll clerk, person who pays our employees, um, and people like that are 2.6% of that salaries and benefit. Our central office non-licensed administrators, people like um, our community liaison and our athletic director are 2% of the salaries and benefit part of the pie. Our central office licensed administrator like me and uh, our director of curriculum are 3.3% of that salaries and benefits pie. Our custodial, oh the green is technology, it's pretty small, it's about 1% of that pie. Um, 
Our custodial crew are 4.4% of the pie. The principals and assistant principals are about 5% of that pie, and our administrative assistants are 2%. Um, all this goes to say is that most of our salary, as it should be, is in the people who directly impact our students. That's the way it should be. Um, and we are not top heavy in other types of positions um, as evidenced by, by this breakup here. Um, so keep going, Christina. I just want to acknowledge, I know Mike has a question and just sort of uh, but no, no, no. I don't Mike, I just want to say, <laughs> clarify that yeah. we do a presentation. We don't take questions from the audience at this point in time, but you will have a chance in public comment to come forward with your questions. Yeah. Thank you for being engaged. Write them down. Yes, thank you. Um, okay, so I really would like the board to understand the fund balance use that we've had over time and give careful consideration of the fund balance use to bring down tax rates. Um, because if you're influxing our budget, I don't know if influxing is an actual word, but if you're inputting our, a lot of money from the fund balance into this year's budget or any year's budget, you got to make that up somewhere, right? The next year's budget either needs a similar amount or needs some sort of cut to have, right? It influences and it has an impact in future yeah. years. Can I, can I just add? Yeah. To clarify, it's the, the fund balance is, is a basically leftover money that we did not spend in previous years. So we cannot count on that. So when we spend from the fund balance, it is not a ongoing revenue source like, like taxes or federal grants. So if, if we put $500,000 of the fund balance in for the budget year, we cannot necessarily count on that $500,000 being there next year. So if that's supporting, say, four positions, we likely have to find another revenue source for those four positions the next year, which is either cuts elsewhere or taxes is generally our choice on that. Yeah. So just for a little history of how we've used the fund balance, just because I know we've got some new members on our board who's asking some questions about our fund balance. And just as a re refresher, because I don't believe this was a part of any of our other um, uh, budget conversations, and that'd be a little fresh. So in FY21, that was the school year that was drastically different. We were potted or virtual school. It wasn't the first year of COVID where there was a complete shutdown. It was the year after that. Um, we, we put uh, or budgeted $240,000 that year in fiscal year 21 to, um, or from the fund balance to, our, to bring down our tax rates. It was meant to offset the merger incentive because when the two two communities merged. People will remember, Jim will probably remember the exact percentage, but in year one, we got like an eight cent discount. In year two, we got a six cent discount. So when you get a discount in a, in a, in a, like a cent discount like that, it's like a two cent increase, right, every year. So that $240,000 was meant to counteract that cent discount that we got. Um, it wasn't used. So we went through the school year and because we were in this very unique situation, we didn't run a deficit, we run, ran a surplus that year. Um, so we ended up actually adding to our fund balance in FY21. Um, we added $807,697. So um, we've added to the fund balance. We didn't touch that $240,000. It stayed in our fund balance and we added to it. FY22, the board decided to dedicate $400,000 from the fund balance in the budgeting process. Again, once we got through fiscal year 22, that wasn't used. Um, we, so we budgeted, things happened. We, uh, we did not have the exact budget needs that we thought we were going to, so we ran a surplus and we had $111,000 added to our fund balance that year. Last year in FY23, again, for the fiscal year 23 budget, the board dedicated $400,000 to it. Um, we used $217,000 of that budgeted amount, and the rest went back into the fund balance. FY24, we won't know exactly how much we need until um, the end of the school year, so, so that's the fiscal year we're currently operating in, so we're not sure, but the board did encumber $400,000 from the fund balance, and the board um, it's encumbered $475,000 of the fund balance for the budget we are trying to pass now. That is what's happened so far um, for what the board has decided around fund balance allocation for this year's budget. 
in future years for board members who have been around for a while, especially those on the finance committee, since uh, since FY21, the board has encumbered the four hundred thousand dollars of the in the fund balance towards next year's budget for each year for several years since FY21. You knew that was going to be put towards budgets, right? As of this year, this year is the last year the board has encumbered any money, has planned to encumber any money from the fund balance. So that's not saying the board can't do that for future years. What I'm saying is you haven't yet. Okay, so it's just information for the board to know. The current status of the fund balance as of June 30th, 20, uh, 2023, we just finally got the final audit like yesterday. Um, so this is a pretty good number. We have 3,677,000 in there. Um, of course, you've encumbered 400,000. We don't know if that's going to be used or not yet because we won't know until the end of this year. Um, you've encumbered 475,000 so far from FY20, for FY25 for next year's budget. You've encumbered $400,000 to make our track safe at the high school. You've encumbered $50,000 for a net zero study. We've already almost completed the facilities report at the, at the cost of $62,000. The equity audit is almost finished at the cost of $35,000, so that's money that's already been spent. And based on your policy, the board needs to reserve 2% of the, of the operating budget cost, which is $577,000. Um, in your fund balance because it's a rainy day fund. You don't want to spend all those funds. So the balance that's available for to the board to consider, knowing all we know about use of one-time funding, is one million six hundred seventy-seven thousand. Okay. So here are some options. The way that uh, Christina and I and the team went about doing this is that we um, put them. I didn't think it was fair or possible to do this without showing each um, tax decrease in two different options. One with Roxbury remaining as it is now, functioning as it does now as a current school, and one as busing Roxbury students to Montpelier. Okay, so, so the board has all the information in front of you on one page of what things would be. Um, the leadership team and Christina and I met today we made some last minute changes based on what principals really wanted uh, this afternoon. Um, we've thought long and hard about these in the last, I don't know, since last Wednesday. It's pretty much all I've really done, as, as, as uh, Mia and Jim can attest to me test, texting them at 9 o'clock on Friday and Saturday night, which I'm sure they appreciated. Um, so the, it's gotten a lot of thought, is what I want to say, and none of this is easy. It's not easy for the team. It's not easy for me. It's not easy for the board, certainly. Um, we are in a really tough jam right now. So here are some options. The boundaries that I use for determining reductions to our budget, um, right now there is no denying whatsoever that our sh we are showing significant gains in our academic and SEL, so social-emotional learning, outcomes because of our current system and how we're running it. We've made significant, uh, we've put significant human resources into both those systems in the last four or so years, and it's working. Um, we have the data to prove it's worth working. We have um, teachers who prove it's working. We're doing a lot of really good things with our systems. So one of my boundaries was to ensure the systems can run effectively by maintaining our human resources that are imperative to those systems. So if you see human resource cuts up there, then know that we have thought long and hard about that and that we are saying with those cuts, we can maintain some the systems that we're running um, to an extent. We want to ensure that all MRPS students have access to outstanding educational opportunities. And we also want to maintain as much of our current programming for students as, as possible. So option A is a 14% increase to our FY24 tax rate. This is, again, assuming a $10,000 dollar, dollar yield, which is not there yet, but we think it will be around there. A 14% increase means the tax rate in Montpelier would be $1.26, which is technically a 13.95% increase. And at Roxbury, the tax rate would be $1.35, with a, it's approximately a 4% tax increase here in Roxbury. So option one. In this scenario, 
would be a general budget of $30,599,000. With option one, we would cut $947,000 from the budget, and we would add an additional $500,000 to the already $475,000 from our fund balance. So that would be $975,000 from our fund balance alone in this option. And we would be decreasing our budget by $1,447,000. We would do that by cutting facilities by $160,000. That essentially is bringing our facilities budget to safety and safety alone. Everything else would be cut out of our facilities budget. Uh, our school building budgets, which our principals are in charge of, would be cut by $40,000. Not individually, but collectively across the four buildings. We have a $30,000 um, athletic equipment uh, ask in, uh, in the former budget. That would be taken out. Administrative technology, which is essentially a lot of uh, communication kind of pieces, we'd cut that by $18,000. We'd cut the Roxbury late bus, which is around $20,000. We would eliminate afternoon busing at Main Street Middle School, Union Elementary School, and Roxbury Village School to save $215,000. We would eliminate the return bus for co-curricular events. So we would, and as an example, we would get our athletes to a sporting <laughs> event and caregivers or would have to carpool home from that event. We would eliminate 1.5 FTE, so that's full-time equivalent from our Maressa Union, which is our instructional assistance, to save $84,000. We would eliminate three FTE from the Teachers Association, which would equal approximately $300,000, and we would eliminate one permanent sub in the district. We currently have three um, at $71,000. That's option one in order to achieve a 14% increase from last year's tax rate in Montpelier. Just a clarification and maybe a reminder, Libby, the school building budgets, that 40000 is on top of, admit, all of these are on top of cuts we've already applied, yes. but just because that one showed up there as well, we already have. So that would be a, a 70000 in, in addition to, so it brings it to 70000 total from school, school. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yes. Can you clarify on the bus, PM bus? Yeah, so we would get kids to school on the AM busing and we wouldn't run a PM busing route for those three buildings. And there is no busing at the high school already. Just so right. everybody knows. Yeah. <clears throat> and maybe just for the there education of the public right. too, Vermont law is that schools don't have to uh, provide Vermont's a privilege. busing, yeah. which is mind-bending, however, just yeah. so you know. Uh, did I hear a, a voice over here too? Sorry. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> the fund balance amount, the 500000 is on top of the 475 was that? Yes. And um, and last week we were looking at like 575. Yeah. Like, how are you deciding what's the right amount of fund balance? What Christina and I are comfortable with in light of statutes and or other things that are coming down the pike. But the board can the board can decide that. That's not our decision to make. That is what we are recommending. So what would the total the fund balance total be in the Nine hundred seventy-five thousand. So just under a million. Yeah. So I just brought us back to this slide. So you have one point six million to work with. Yeah. So this would be reducing this by another five hundred thousand. Right. To get us to about six hundred thousand total left over. No. One point two. No. One point one. One point one. Oh, okay. 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 Keeping in mind that if you keep adding fund balance money, you need to make that up in the next school budget. It's one-time funding. Yeah. And Libby, the I really appreciate this level of detail, like really, really appreciate this level of detail. For our understanding for the conversation tonight, uh, I'm operating with like fund balance. That's a thing that the board could play with, but we're probably not in a position to tell you, well, really, could it be 180 from facilities? Like we should just, okay. We have gone through this with a fine tooth yeah. comb. Yeah, I believe it. Uh, option two would be saving around the same amount of money. We would bus students to attend, who currently attend RVS to UES, and the savings are broken out um, there. That is primarily staffing here at RVS and pieces at RVS, or other pieces that are con contributing to the cost at RVS. So these are not as an and, presented as an and, these are ors, yeah. the two options. Am I correct that most of those cuts in positions 
you were saying that a lot of those employees could be absorbed by open positions at Union Elementary. For Roxbury? Yeah. Yes. We repeat the questions over here. Um, so we talked at the last Wednesday's board meeting around um, the understanding that our teachers and our instructional assistants, for that matter, and our administrative assistants and tech and custodial staff are all under a union contract, which is run by seniority. So, um, and the way our union contract works, that if there is a position that is rift that can be a, achieved through a resignation or a retirement, then that is what achieves the RIF. So, um, we have right now four, four resignation, four resignations, two retirements, two resignations at Union Elementary School in our K six licensure area, which is the what the classroom teachers here at Roxbury, obviously, are K-6 licensed teachers. Um, they would slide into those positions. The part-time staff here, um, we would not have positions for them open currently. That would be a riff. But we did include uh, the four positions you just mentioned at UES. Does that include the cut we made in the original version of the budget? We did. No, we have five. Them. You're right. Okay. Why is there a bus savings on option two? Because Roxbury, we have um, we have a bus that runs from Montpelier to Roxbury, and we also have a bus that runs in Roxbury for just the village school. Oh, um, so that the one that is just in Roxbury would right. not. Oh, so it would like uh, okay. So there'd still be a bus back and forth. Yeah. And would there still be? Okay, option B, and we're going to go one by one here through till 10%, um, but I'm just going to say what we've added to the cuts, which are uh, bolded. So option B would be a 13% increase to the Montpelier tax rate. Um, it would be a 2.66% increase to the Roxbury tax rate. Um, we would cut all of the things from option, from the last from, uh, slide. Um, but this one, because we have to increase the number cut, we would we would eliminate all busing for Main Street Middle School, Union, and Roxbury to save $450,000. Everything else on that list is the same. Uh, option two, we would bus RVS students to Union Elementary School. In addition to that, we would cut two um, more MREA, which are teachers, so that uh, would equal 196. You see the 8.9 FTE total because that's um, the Roxbury teachers FTEs plus the um, two additional ones. We'd still cut the administrative technology and the athletic equipment to get to that number. To get to a 12% increase, um, which would be a dollar, or I'm sorry, 1.78% increase here in Roxbury. In addition to everything you've already seen, <coughs> From the 13% increase, we would cut four FTE from our teaching staff. We would cut one enrichment teacher, or one enrichment employee, and we would cut our clubs by $15,000. And option two, we would bus students from RVS to Union. We have the two MREA RIFs, more MREA RIFs. We would include 1.5 FTE from our instructional assistance staff. We would include one permanent sub in option two, and we would add a $50,000 cut to our facilities budget. Um, what's an enrichment teacher? It's a person um, who works a lot with after school activities and supports for students. And how, uh, how is that separate from like clubs? Like, would that be considered like? A it's a different position. Okay. Yeah. Uh, keep going, Christina. Oh, you're there. All right. 11% um, increase to the Montpelier tax rate, a 9.93% increase to the Roxbury tax rate. We would increase the number of RIFs in our teaching staff to six. In our clubs, we would cut the club allotment to 30, by 35,000. Everything else is the same. On option two, we would have a $20,000 cut in the facilities budget and we would cut three permanent subs um, in the Montpelier schools 
to save two hundred twelve thousand dollars. And just to be clear, the, the highlighted, the uh, bolded items were added from the previous slide. Yes. Yeah. Yes. The bolded average are changes from the previous slide. And then finally, the hardest to achieve here is a 10% increase to our fiscal year 24 tax rate. So it would be a 0.05% increase here in Roxbury. We would eliminate, to option one, we would um, have everything that was in there before and we would eliminate the three permanent subs in option one there. Um, in option two, we would increase the MREA RIFs, just one teacher. Um, and we would cut our facilities budget $130,000 in that option. So let me really quickly. Yep. Um, you had mentioned um, in the last, our last board meeting that the paradox, right, of our, of our capital fund budget passing and our general fund budget not passing. Um, and, and I had emailed you about, like, what sort of flexibility do we have in shifting things out of our general budget and into that capital fund budget? Presume, and the example I gave in my message to you was anything related to the track is facilities, is that not capital fund? And could we shift those to that budget and not have that come from our fund balance? The answer to that, I believe, is yes. Because there isn't a capital fund police that's going to come see what we use that money mm -hmm. for as long as it's for facilities. Yes. The purpose of a capital plan is for big time things. So the, one of the challenges that I ha that we have with that, um, and we didn't put the number for how much is in the capital fund currently, but um, we have a roof that needs replacing over the cafeteria at Mont Montpelier High School, which needs the capital fund to do that. Um, so... It started leaking this past year, and we need to replace it with the capital fund. I don't know how much will be left after that. We also have been planning for window replacement for quite a while at Union at Main Street. At Main Street, um, there are rooms in the second floor of Main Street Middle School that probably reach 95 degrees in the sun, in the warmer months, and the teachers cannot open the windows on their own. They have to call the custodian who has to use a special tool um, to open those windows. And then, likewise, in the winter, there are breezes that come through. So um, we have some major window needs as well. So there are, there are major needs. That, so, yeah. yes, you, the board can decide to do that, and that is well within the purview of the board. I will just say that I would not be doing Andrew, who is our facilities manager, any justice if I did not say that the roof comes first. Isn't it also paying back a bond? Not the, not the capital plan. Capital plan that's no. that's, that's baked into our budget. Yeah, okay. we, we can't not do that. How much is in the capital fund? 270 I think, right? Well, we add 270 no, we each year, oh. but I'd have to go back and look at exactly how much oh. is in it. Okay. I think I there's can, about 500000 I can probably find it. Yeah, from previous budget. So I was asked to put uh, some options here. Um, somebody on the board asked if we were to provide an after school, if we were to bus students to Union Elementary School and provide an after school option here at RBS, so we would bus students back here for after school. Um, we can certainly do that. That's not a problem at all. The cost of that would be around $150,000. We know that because we just got a, or last, the after school program currently is running on a grant. Um, that is $150,000. So the cost of the after school program is about $150,000. We did apply for the same state grant for next year for this amount of money. Um, like I said, the current after school program here is operating using that state money and we have applied for it. Um, so I'm not sure if we'll get it or not. I'm not even sure when we find out. Uh, we have transportation. There currently is a bus that runs after school with Montpelier High School and Main Street Middle School students to Roxbury. So we have that bus already. That's not an additional cost. Students can be right, dropped off right at RVS. No cost there. The partial use of the building is approximately, just slightly less than $60,000 for like partial usage in that, terms, in that term. The challenge with this scenario is staffing. 
Um, currently, our program has a site director whose working hours are 9 to 5-ish. Um, that person could work at UES with adjusted hours and drive time and mileage included in the contract to maintain the position. However, the other staff um, are current teachers at RBS who would be working at Union Elementary School um, and the likelihood that they would drive to Roxbury for two hours employment and then drive to wherever they, they are living um, may not be very likely. Um, and so we would most likely need community members to staff the program uh, or find some other staffing configuration for the program. For a two hour shift a day from, you know, uh, about, it would probably be about 3.30 to 5.30. That's a tough shift to fill. Uh, the cost, without the grant, families would have to pay for the service or the program would have to be paid for out of the fund balance. Um, so I was just asked for that uh, scenario and the cost associated with it. The um, cost of the after-school program, would the grant, if it comes through, cover the whole thing? It would be for, I believe we asked for about $150,000. Looking at Tina and Shannon in the back there. Tina's nodding her head at me. Okay. <laughs> Thumbs up, yes. Tell us, Adelie, that that is not without a side of the scale contribution from families, um, but there is space and it is not an excessive scale. Yes. Um, and that's the presentation that we have, and I'd open it up for board discussion. I found the answer to Tim's question. According to uh, the budget presentation from January 3rd, with the contribution that's going in for FY25, the 270 that was a thousand that was approved by voters, there is an, there and if we spend the money that we plan to spend in FY25, there would be 121,467 dollars left in the capital plan. But there's also a lot of numbers that go into that, so you can find it in the slideshow from the budget presentation on January 3rd, so you can look more in depth at that. It's slide number 29. Right. If we were to use the money in the capital plan for the track, how would that affect these numbers? Would it? Well, according to what Mia just said, we would have probably about $100,000 to use. Does that, sorry, does that affect the tax rates? No. No. Oh, right, okay. Tim, okay. can we go through the fund balance and um, slide again? And just, that was really quick, and I'm not sure I, I gathered all of it in my head. Um, and I'd like to better understand um, what is recognizing that, you know, the, there are certain things you said are already spent. Can you help me understand what's sort of out the door already and what's not? Sure. Um, we don't know how much of, if I just go down the line there, Tim, yeah, we don't, we don't know. For, sorry, for 24, I guess that's the projection. Yeah, like, we don't. Do you, do you have, uh, you know, two quarters in? No. Mm -hmm. um, fair enough. And same for 25, whatever right. it is, what it is. I guess it's the other the other things. So far for the MHS track, we've spent uh, about $50,000 um, out of that $400,000. The net zero study has not been done. So that... I'm looking at Kristen. That's true. Yeah, yeah. okay. <laughs> the net zero study has not been done or even contracted out. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Right? Correct. Right. So, yeah. so that money is encumbered, but it has not been used or claimed in any way. The facilities report is gone. The equity audit, like both facilities and equity have both happened, and so that money is not available. And then the 577000 number is not available to you because that's, that's like the piggy bank. reserve for fiscal 24 and fiscal 25 and our reserves. We've got about 2.1 million if we choose to go in a different direction with that's what's available to us. Yes. Yeah, yeah just two points on that. One, you know, the point before, it's it's a one-time revenue source, so that would be a whole. Uh, and the second is we do have a potential significant Sorry, expense. I said, one, it's, it's a one-time revenue source, so it would create a hole. And the second is, particularly our high school, 
was built at the time that PCBs were a pretty uh, common feature in caulking in particular. And we are scheduled to have that tested and we may have fairly significant remediation costs from that. That, that if we don't have the reserve for it, we'll either have to use taxes for it or bond it. Or get funds from the state. Or what? There won't be any funds for the state unless they change their yeah. unless they change their um, trajectory right now. And at the same time, their trajectory right now is to pause the PCB yeah. testing. So, so there's there's a plus and a minus yeah, there. Yeah. <laughs> so and, and our plan, just to be clear, is to not do it if the state mandate's no longer there. Right. Yeah. So then we wouldn't have a cost. Right. Okay. Cost. And the state's stopping so that they can get funds to fund remediation if they pick it back up. Is that the House right? Education Committee is working very hard to pause, maybe not use the word stop, but pause indefinitely the the testing requirements until they can find a state source for payment right. for mitigation and remediation. I don't know what this the I, like it's in House Ed right now is my understanding. It will need to go to Senate Ed, which may have a different mindset. I don't know. Let me do I remember correctly that the PCBs we are we don't know exactly what's at the high school, but the other tests came in for the other schools and they were um, negative. Uh, Roxbury right? has not been tested and and the high school have not been tested. Okay. And then the other two schools did not they had no PCBs. Okay. Yeah, and they were built again. Like U thirty two was tested, and U thirty two, which was built at the same time, it never says, does have PCB presence. So, so they're going to have to. I mean, it's not it's not the situation that Burlington High School is in, which was was there were PCBs horrible. There were PCBs <laughs> looking at it. It was, it was not a safe building to be in. And U thirty, yeah, you do not want PCBs in your building. They're they're a health hazard. They cause cancer and other other illnesses. Um, U32's problem apparently is, is neither nearly as severe nor as hard to remedy as BH, as Burlington High School. And that is the situation most buildings are in. Burlington High School is unique in terms of needing literally to be torn to the ground. And they're building another one for, I think, $60 million, um, which would not be a great situation to be in. But um, this guy. most of the other, yeah, it's, it's not an insignificant expense, but it's not that. If we were to cut three permanent subs, Libby, how would that, I don't want to ask for your too subjective opinion, but would that <laughs> be viable? How would that look in the schools? So the reason we have permanent subs is because um, we know that we have to provide an environment for our teachers where they can teach um, well, right, and we are ha we had a subbing we have a subbing shortage. We don't have I don't know why, but we don't have lots of people coming to be guest teachers in our school buildings. Um, and so we started the permanent substitutes last school year, uh, and they provide relief and for our teaching staff because if we don't have a substitute, then we have to move somebody, we have to shift things around. So we have to switch, shift instructional assistance around, which means other services are not covered. Um, we have to potentially shift teachers around, they have to cover. Um, so it provides more stress on our teaching staff during the, it has the potential to provide more teaching stress on our teaching staff during the day. This year's a rather unique year in that we've lost a few professionals mid-year and our permanent subs immediately stepped in to have a sense of normalcy for kids in those classrooms. Um, we would not have had that freedom. We would have been cobbling things together for those positions if we had not had our permanent subs. So um, you'd see from the last presentation last Wednesday, the permanent subs were in there because I didn't have enough time to really work through lots of options. But thinking about the... Um, stability that those positions provide in our buildings, they move down on the list, on the priority list for this presentation. My understanding is that 
permanent subs receive benefits as opposed to yes, non that's why the price tag is so big. Do not receive benefits, right? Yes. She asked about permanent subs receiving benefits. Oh, the sorry, I'm yes. speaking that way. <laughs> so permanent subs receive benefits, non permanent subs do not, which right. is why they're expensive. Yeah, and they're expected to be there five days a week. Yeah. And uh, I know from having worked in schools that there are good subs and there are not so great subs, and it makes a big difference in what happens in a classroom. Um, but what I'm wondering is, would it be possible to pay part of insurance costs as opposed to the whole thing? Maybe that would be a way to keep them in there. I'm just throwing that out there. Yeah, legally, legally, if an employee works a certain amount of hours during the week on a regular basis, then we, by law, have to provide health care okay. benefits. It's a statewide bargaining. Okay, thanks. I'll be, as one of my coworkers says, the skunk at the garden party. Um, I'm not going to second guess or question any of your options. I know how much time you guys have put in here. So I think the reality is we have been given a very strong message. We are in a very difficult situation. There's not going to be, as you said, there's not going to be an easy answer, and there are going to be a lot of people who are upset no matter which options that we choose. And I do, um, I do just want to say, for what it's worth, for everyone who has been here tonight, and, and I appreciate that very much, and I'm, um, there are also a lot of, again, for better or worse, um, Montpelier residents who have been very clear that they will vote no again if we do not close Roxbury School this year or next year. There has definitely been a mandate from our voters. I'm not saying it's right or wrong. It's just the reality. Um, I just want you folks to know that. I'm actually surprised there aren't more here. Um, so we are we are being forced to do something. And as we've talked about a lot, a lot of these things are beyond our control. Um, I'm really concerned about the busing. It doesn't sound like the busing is working great now. I've, that's one of the biggest things I've heard. So I'm not sure we don't have a solution to that. But the idea of losing educators and losing buses and losing um, um, starting to sort of chip away every year at our getting our students safely to school and having teachers. I don't know how, it's not like we have empty classrooms right now where we have teachers that we don't need in the classroom. So I'm not even sure what cutting teachers looks like either. Um, so I think we're just backed into a corner here and, and I hope the Montpelier voters will understand how challenging this is and understand that um, we are doing our due diligence to find something to do here. But I just wanted to make that, I just wanted to start the skunk at the garden party conversation. Um, it's heartbreaking and it's not easy no matter what we do. We're permanently changing our district. Jill, thank you for being the brave one to come forward and initiate the discussion. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, I feel beholden to my community who came out in great numbers tonight, and I appreciate all of you uh, for entering the room and sharing what you did, and I know there's more out there in the audience that hasn't been shared yet. Um, and I do wonder where my board members are at in terms of, um, I, I get the school board emails, and um, if I were to count the number uh, of emails that we have received from Montpelier residents that are advocating very clearly for the closure of Roxbury Village School. Uh, I don't know where the ticker would be at at this point. Um, and I wonder where my fellow board members are in kind of receiving that and integrating that into your decision making now. Um, <clears throat> I think clearly what you heard tonight was a very clear request to stay consistent with how this board uh, rolls, to quote one of our uh, public commenters, which is to do community engagement. And in fact, it's uh, one of our top three uh, priorities that we identified after pouring over that for hours and days and weeks, I would say. Um, <clears throat> and we prioritize that for ourselves and for the community and to uh, quickly and abruptly close the school is actually inconsistent with what we say our priorities are. I must, I, I don't, a 24% tax rate increase is, is horrific and very hard to bear. And I just want to get this, these pieces out. Um, I want to just go back to, and this preceded my time on the board, 
Um, there were, I believe, two separate or maybe integrated efforts to look at alternative uses for um, RVS, where it could potentially be somewhat repurposed and kind of being an added enhancement to the wonderful offers that MRPS has to offer. You know, it was looked at, could it be an immersion language yeah. school opportunity? Could it be um, almost like a magnet school for outdoor education? I think that might have been in the mix. But it just feels like that work was started. It wasn't finished. Um, and it seems like we would be shortchanging uh, the process to reimagine what this school could be as an asset to the district. So I just want to point us that out for us, that resources were spent in looking at alternative uses, um, and that work was not complete. Um, <clears throat> so to that end, I kind of wonder, are we cutting off our nose to spite our face, uh, you know, if we're trying to kind of, you know, attract new students? Again, that would all have to be fleshed out, how much of that is an actual reality. Um, but I just want to point that out for folks, because I think some folks are shocked, like, how did we get here and get so sudden? Get here so suddenly, and that's been really hard for folks to understand. Um, but I do think there were conversations that happened at the board level. Uh, they weren't completed processes, and as you all know, we're kind of experiencing like a three-part meteor, right? There was COVID, flooding, fires. I can't remember what other biblical things have happened in the last three years. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but that process was initiated. However, it was not completed. Um, and so just to uh, kind of echo the community in terms of their preference for a, a lengthened runway such that we can really do the due diligence, you know, I know that this board is incredibly equity focused um, and we have not applied an equity lens to this and I don't know where it would fall. I'm open to that, but without actually having a process, we cannot say one way or the other. Um, so I also just would like to, you know, get at the the, the question I think that is coming up for a lot of people is um, what is the actual net savings of the closure of RVS? Um, I, I, I also, and I'll be honest with you, I, I, find it hard, I find it hard to believe that RVS would survive beyond next year. Um, I n understand the reality of the state of Vermont. Thank you, Jay Hooper, for being here tonight, who's our, um, one of our House representatives. Um, the state is in crisis, the house is on fire. I can't imagine this is the first drastic change that we're gonna see in the next short amount of time. And I think this board has a real responsibility to get engaged with advocacy um, sooner than later to be a part of that conversation. Um, I lost my train of thought. Um, <laughs> yeah, so thank you, lengthen the runway. Um, so that we can have the, the fair uh, discussion um, I think something that I'm having a lot of concern about is uh, n no matter what happens here, our communities are in partnership, no matter where this goes. And I, I think I speak for a lot of the Roxbury community in that, like, we want to preserve this partnership and we want this, we, we want to ensure that whatever we're doing um, can, can strengthen a foundation to then to also move forward from. So I also would just like to hear what other board members would think about, um, you know, so if, if board members, and this is also a process question, um, does, does this board have to vote to close the school prior to forwarding a budget that effectively closes the school? Libby shaking her head no. Okay, thank you for clarifying. No, the board, has, the board would be voting on a budget number. Yeah. Yep. So the budget, so, and... 30 million, if it were option A, for mm -hmm. instance, the board and what goes on the warning that voters vote on is $30,599,114. Yep. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I guess I just want to come back to, and I want to make sure that we have ears out to the Roxbury community in terms of the, the net savings, because I think if, if we're, if this community is going to experience the loss of this school and the incredible pain and hurt and I, I think harm is sometimes unknown because I don't think we have a crystal ball of if the school closes then what opportunity does it become. Undoubtedly it needs a process and a lot of community input. Um, but I also 
if, if that is going to be the reality here, I also would like for the board to consider ways in which we can shore up Roxbury and shore up this partnership and talk about the things like increased busing and um, after school programming, not only at, you know for Roxbury and potentially at RBS, if that makes sense. And I'm interested to hear from uh, you know the professionals in the room like Casey, like Shan, like Tina, and, and what the sensibility would be in terms of, I hear kind of the logistical challenges of maintaining a uh, uh, an after school program here, but um, you know, does it make sense to have that at UES? So added after school programming also at the Main Street middle school level. Um, if we are to lose the school, I think about our families who have middle school students um, who are gonna get dropped off and elementary school students. And I think we had a, a resident say last week, you know, there's 10 miles of paved road in Roxbury. The bus never jumps off the paved road. So our kids are getting dropped off at street intersections, potentially one to two to three, four plus miles from their home. So I, I'm just thinking about how we can create more opportunities for after school enrichment um, across our elementary and our middle school so we can make sure that our kids are safe. Um, and I, I just think about the operation and maintenance of this building and if this board would be willing to support a budget that maintains the building for a year so that we could actually have a process. It could be the decision that Roxbury students attend uh, UES and this board could continue a, a dialogue about how, what the use of this building is and to maintain it. I've spoken enough. I digress. I mean, I will jump in. My, yeah. Yeah, it's 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 a very it's a very tough position to be in, and um, I mean, my I'll just cut to the chase. My sense is that I think the I think the Montpelier community would support some use of this building for a year to keep it as a community center and to have a longer term discussion about its long term use. I do not think the Montpelier community would support. The existing use of, of the school in in a budget, especially with some of the other uh, cuts there, I, I think I think I think the Montpelier community is is you know wants to keep relationships between town good, and they want to have to take care of Roxbury to the extent they can. I think the choice of the price tag for its current operation, we've got a pretty clear message that that is too high. And that the things I think that we'd have to give up to get down to, you know, 24% was, I'm just gonna put it out there, it was a ridiculous ask of our taxpayers, given that we already have high, high taxes. It, it, was, it was a very hard thing for me to justify to my neighbors to ask them to pay that much for an increase when I know, I know a lot of them, even, you know, even people who, uh, appear to be doing well are having trouble meeting that. Just costs have gone up. It's, it's very it's very hard. There were a lot of very soft yeses with that number. Um, I, I think that, you know, and I think, you know, Jill put it out there, I think there's a, a portion of the town that sees this as fairly or not, the largest expense that can be saved with the least educational impact. Um, but I do think that there is room if the use of the building changes and it's very clear that it's going to be a year process to have something like to keep it open for after school care, to have busing to do that to have the committee really be focused on what does that after school care look like? What does the busing look like? How do we take care of the kids who are gonna have that change and we have some time for that? I think, I think Montpelier would be supportive of that and we could probably get a budget closer to the 14% number passed with that. I think the other options, I mean, I, I, it's all speculation and if it wasn't, you know, if we had a crystal ball, we, we could, solve this thing in five minutes. We don't. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't be here tonight. No. Um, Hopefully only till 8.30. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Laughable. Uh, I think if, I, I think, I, I think if we had something like that, we could get closer to 14%. I, I think if we start going into, I mean, I can just hear the screams if we take away 
UES busing. This, I mean, day or night. Uh, you know, that's 60 kindergartners who, you know, I mean, Montpelier is walkable for about 40% of it. Uh, and, you know, you take it down to a five-year-old and it's walkable for maybe, you know, three blocks. Uh, so, so that's, 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 that's my sense, you know, hearing from people, getting the stuff we had, it's, it's all guesswork. Um, yeah, and someone said we had low voter turnout. We actually had very high voter turnout. We had 700 people more in this, in this vote in Montpelier than we did with our last vote. Um, so it's, it's not, it's not that people weren't engaged or people weren't watching. Kristen, one piece that I think I heard you say, and mm -hmm. if you didn't say it, then just correct me, but, um, the idea that if we were to bus students from here to Union, mm -hmm. that it weren't being used as a day school, mm -hmm. um, that the and the district would still own it, obviously, mm -hmm. until a decision is made. Yep. <laughs> this, you've met Andrew, you've met Tom, he's here today. <laughs> I need to bring him down here. Mm -hmm. um, this building would not be in disrepair yep. in any way. Andrew has gone through with Tom and Christina uh, yesterday and today, and made a made a chart of all the ways for operations and maintenance. It is currently we are currently functioning at. Looked at how they would do it if it weren't operating as a school building during the day and what they believe that would cost. It's all a, a you know a hypothesis. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, based on two days' work, but they've done that work um, to ensure the the paths are shoveled in the winter and the lawn is mowed and the you know and the building is cleaned and the bathrooms are always clean and the heat still remains on and electricity is like all of those things are being considered right now mm -hmm. by our maintenance crew mm -hmm. so i don't want anybody to think this building would go into disrepair because it wouldn't mm -hmm. if it weren't used during the day mm -hmm. and that's being thought of already thank you can i just for any of you that aren't fully aware why we submitted a budget that had a 24% increase in Montpelier, <clears throat> it's because there was one version of a law that we made a great budget for. <clears throat> and then the law changed at the very last minute. And we had basically seven days to rewrite the budget. Um, and it didn't feel like there was enough time. And, you know, this building has always been the elephant in the room, you know, this, we have an equity committee, <clears throat> excuse me, we have an equity committee. We want equity in the district. It could never happen with this building in full operation because you can't have as many resources in this space as you can have at UES. Roxbury never wanted the same thing as what UES has, but there's only one school board and we can only treat every kid the same. We can't, you can't do it different. Every kid should be treated as much the same as possible, and we could never get it the same because you could never get the same resources in this building as that are at UES. So equity has been a lip service job by this board for years, in my opinion. If this building is no longer used for our elementary schools, we will really, I, there will be a lot of discussions about true equity, real access to everything that the district has to offer. And that also means an alternative thinking about how we move our smallest kids all this distance. Not, you know, and I don't know what that means, whether there's an, an extra bus stop at the Village Mobile and we have a contract with the Village Mobile so that the kids can sit at the table there and drink tea while they're waiting for the bus. I have no idea. But, but something, because right now there's a bus that goes from Steel Hill up to the mobile and back to Roxbury. It picks up kids here, it picks up kids on the way, and then it goes all the way to Main Street Middle School and to the high school and it takes an hour and 20 minutes. We can't do that. And it's been harmful on so many levels, but we've wanted to keep our school alive because it's the heart of this community. And it's, it's these are the binds that we've been in. You know, and Montpelier is getting mashed by this tax rate. And we don't want to, we want a good relationship. And I want to say we deserve a year. And of course we deserve a year. But I don't think they're going to pass a budget with RVS in it as it currently stands. What I do think is that 
if there's a use for the school and the after school program works out, that's fantastic. It's a great transition for our kids. I don't think the budget will pass if the, if the building is in it the way it currently is. The after school program keeps some life in this building and in this space. Um, it, it gives us a year to figure out how to transition what this building looks like and what it does for our community. It's a, it's a pretty good middle road. It's, a, it's kind of a compromise. And I mean, we deserve a year, but we're just not in a situation where we get what we deserve, you know, and that's just the way life is. I mean, unless the board keeps the school, but it's, it's going to be hard to staff. There are a lot of things. There are a lot of things. There are a lot of things that are small things that can't even be spoken about on a public level that are also going to complicate the possibility of the building functioning as it does now next year. It's just a really crappy situation. I know it's hard. Thank you. Alara? Um, well, I just had a thought like surrounding the discussion of this discussion. Um, I know there's a lot of uncertainty like here and like with the adults in the room, but also with the students who go to this school. And I know that Montpelier High School is really good at like community building and like restorative circles and having discussions with students. So maybe that requires like conversations with like educators here, but I would advocate for like yeah, like that's what I'm saying. Like, um, <laughs> like um, a conversation like with educators and students together here at this school because I think just because they are at like an elementary level doesn't mean they don't have the capacity to hold meaningful conversations about their feelings and how they feel, and it can also help with like eliminating the uncertainty that like kids feel for just like hearing secondhand news from their parents and the community. Yeah. This is why we have student reps on the board. Uh, I think my biggest concern here is overreacting to the message that we got on town meeting day. What strikes me is, you know, this board put forward a 24% tax increase in Montpelier. What was it 12 in Roxbury? Somewhere around there. Something like that. 45% something around there voted for that in Montpelier and it passed in Roxbury. So this was not a landslide election. Uh, you know, respectfully, I just take a different um, view of it. What the message we had on town meeting day and, you know, in talking to folks after I've heard a lot of concern about panicking and making a decision in a couple of weeks that's irrevocable, particularly when there, there may be an option through some more aggressive utilization of our fund balance, which is substantial and well north of our policy limits. And I don't think it can be done. I think, Jim, to your point, whenever you're going to use one-time funds, you're creating pressure in the year out. That's clear. And so... Were there to be some discussion of busing children in RBS to UES instead, I would be much more in favor of having a year to do it in a bit more of a thoughtful way. I've been, I, it struck me how, you know, how many voices from this community <coughs> I've heard say, you know, I have, haven't even said don't close us, just like, give us the year. Like, let's figure out how to do it rationally. And we have the money to do that if we think that, or if we get to a collective view that it probably just is the year. I mean, that's a tough thing to do, but it's it would feel a lot better for me to know that we did this in a thoughtful way where we could hear voices and perhaps the conversation is a little less on whether to make the change, but it's how to do it most effectively with due consideration for all voices and with the equity principles that this board espouses um, at the fore. 
So I think that um, with effectively $2.1 million in the bank account, kind of having either of these options seems to be a bit of an overreaction at an unduly fast pace. And I would be in support of taking a beat, going a little bit slower, and giving this a little bit more consideration. There is a possibility that I know Rhett, I believe, said in our last board meeting that staffing will be difficult in this building for one more year. Um, so I just want to put that out there, that the board absolutely could decide to do that and spend most of the fund balance for um, to keep Roxbury open, and I can't staff the building. And so instead of having a transition time from now until August. I'd have a transition time from August until the kids come at, at Labor Day. So I just, I think that needs to be stated. Um, and that's gonna, could be in, interpreted in multiple ways. However, I think that staffing will be a problem if, if the message has been put out that, you know, Roxbury's gonna be open for one more year. I have good teachers here who may not want to be here for one more year. In some ways, I think it's all the more reason, you know, because the flip side is that if we do it right now, that those same teachers really didn't have the choice to think and think through those options. I think at this point, giving them that, you know, the choice, maybe there's someone that wants to get into the district. It's worth taking the shot. My understanding is that teacher contracts are an April thing, right? Mm -hmm. so April 15th. Have, so we have a sense then. Well, no, or when? Teachers' contracts have to be returned by May 1st. By May 1st. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I guess I, I would be a little worried about over, again, that seems to me a low probability like, that we couldn't staff a school full stop. Maybe it, I, I don't know how often that happens, but. We came very close last year. But we made it. By last year, do you mean like August, a few months ago? <coughs> we hired a, we hired our last needed teacher here in late July. This summer. It's just a, it's just a reality that we have to face, and I don't mean to be a downer, and I don't mean to look like I'm choosing one side or the other, because the board can certainly do that, and we will work very hard to ensure, but there. There is a level that we need that, you know, I met with the Roxbury staff yesterday afternoon, um, and I will not speak for them because I can't as a group, uh, but we had a pretty frank conversation about, you know, a lot of questions of if it stays one more year, can I voluntarily transfer over to UES into one of the openings? Well, yeah, you can. You know, you can request to do that. So there are lots of, um, there, the staff is definitely rightfully um, protecting themselves and thinking through all their options for here. So um, that, that, will, that could potentially be a challenge. Okay, we'll open up for public comment in a minute. Um, Near him. I don't actually know if I need to be raising my hand, but okay. it's, you did. Yeah. it's a muscle memory now. Um, I'm trying to look at this from the lens of what our role is supposed to be here, which is, you know, the best interest of the students. I don't know if I can represent Roxbury Village School students. I probably can't. Um, but I do feel that seeing the testing data that we've seen hearing about the staffing difficulties here, knowing that Roxbury can't provide the same services and extracurriculars that UES can, I do feel that Roxbury students are going to receive a far better education at UES, and I think that's worth saying. Um, I totally understand the loss to the community and um, 
the detriment to the students of those long bus rides. And I want to make sure that whatever the decision it is that we end up making, we have an equitable equitable process to make sure that the students, like Alara said, understand what's going on and that those bus routes, as much as I know it's not up to us to discuss the minutia of bus routes, um, that those are equitable and are the best possible for the students. I also just want to mention, I live in a middle class family. I couldn't convince my parents to vote for this budget. Mm. That's not a good sign to me. I go to the school, I'm on the school board, if I can't convince <laughs> my parents to vote for the budget. It's just that increase, that tax increase is like one less grocery run a month. It's not viable um, for us. And so I think that busing those students to UES will be in the best interests of those students. I feel incredibly for the residents of Roxbury, and I want to make sure that that change is made as equitably as possible. I want to make sure that the Roxbury committee is used um, in the best way possible to make this uh, make this process uh, as best as it can be. But yeah, it's such a painful decision, and I really feel for all the Roxbury residents in the room. I'll say just one more. Thank you so much for saying what we all have really struggled to say, but needed to be said. Um, I. I hope that um, if we do end up transitioning, I, I love, I, I don't love in the, I really appreciate the forward thinking that you just articulated, Rhett, about how to, how to retain the positive. I do hope that, I grew up in the Northeast Kingdom where the school bus had to go through mud season and icy roads and all kinds of things on the back roads in Goss Hollow and they figured it out. So I, I would hope that if we don't physically have the school here that we would be able to provide door-to-door -door bus service because it sounds like this this arrangement is not working right now and now we're at the point where it's become this sort of like inevitable um, conflict between the communities which is the opposite of the whole intent of this so that would be I, I think what you just articulated is is really well said I love the idea of using the school for a year as still remaining the hub for the after school and maybe it's I don't I, I don't know if we've talked about pre-k at all in this conversation um, but I, I'm very worried about the outcomes for students I'm very worried about even if we if we go with option one with the highest tax increase we're still cutting afternoon busing for all of the schools um, we're losing no. multiple staff members we're eliminating PM busing for MS, MS, oh, UES. Saying, if we don't. If we don't, right. right so yeah. option one, yeah. under the 14%, we are still creating more hardship with busing, not less. Yeah. And we're losing really fantastic teachers on top of the teachers we have already cut in our first round of the budget. Um, this community reminds me a little of where um, I went to a school called Riverside in Lindenville for a few years, and it was a community run it was in like an old farmhouse there were bats in the in the barn where we did all our plays and the water smelled like sulfur but it was like the most amazing fantastic community school and i really do feel like that that would be my vision for this community if there was interest in hosting um some sort of alternative school here it seems like there's momentum there's interest there's passion um and the reality is if we continue to postpone what feels like the inevitable and frankly has felt like the inevitable since this merger we're going to continue to decimate the experience of all the students in the district we're going to continue to lose staff we're going to continue to bleed services and we may not be able to hire folks to come to work in the building um, I don't know I don't expect the legislature to come to our rescue anytime soon there's only so much money that all of Vermonters are paying for property tax so we're being forced to make a really hard decision and I'm just concerned even if we go with the 14 percent increase for Montpelier and we go with option one which is cutting staff cutting busing cutting all the different budgets the budget will go down and we will have suffered a significant consequence um, 
So I'd love to see if we could find some way to um, to create the after school option at RVS to provide that timeline for a transition. Yeah. Um, I might risk being the skunk at the garden party now, um, but I too feel that it is important for us not to overreact. Um, we definitely got a clear message on town meeting day that a 24% tax increase was un unimaginable, and I get it. If we could take a time machine back to approximately five weeks ago, when it was February, our February 7th meeting, and we had the option of taking that one week, as Rhett said, <laughs> and opening up our budget, I was advocating for doing that to see if we could find any other savings because I think it was an outrageous ask, as, as Jim said. And we also don't know, we, we know that it was a no to 24%. We last week at, said, gave Libby the direction, try to get somewhere around 10 to 14%. I said last week, I think we're just guessing. This is a guessing game. I, in, and I believe, um, well, I first, I, I want to pause and take this opportunity to say, uh, it's hard to look at all the faces in the room, but I want to say thank you to you for being here, and I want to say thank you very much to every single person who wrote us a letter over the last week, two weeks, one month. We have been asking to hear from our community members, and we are hearing from them, and I so very much appreciate the thoughtfulness that has gone in to the statements said tonight and to the emails that we have received. There is real consideration. I fervently hope that at the end of all of this, we are still in partnership, Kristen, as two, two towns in one community. And the, for the vast majority of the conversation we've had, I do believe that that's possible. And I think it is also possible to find a way to do this in a non-reactive, not it, more deliberate way. And so the skunk at the garden party proposal that I have, a curiosity that I have is from my fellow board members, what, what would you, would you consider something like, we look at what it would look like to get to a 16% tax rate increase, not a 24, still a big drop from 24, and maybe a slightly larger cut, draw from the fund balance in order to give us that <laughs> ability to be more deliberative. I am not actually, I'm gonna get into a lot of trouble for saying this maybe, but I'm not counting on a ticker, the, the number, because we have a, a much smaller community here, uh, the number of, of um, comments that we're getting because we have a much smaller community here than we do in Montpelier. So of course the voices, the number of voices in Montpelier are going to outweigh the number of voices in Roxbury. And to that point, we have had voices in Montpelier saying, please don't overreact. Please take time to consider this decision. It's a very big decision. So I don't want it to seem to the folks sitting in this room that it's all or nothing in Montpelier either. And um, so I, I think t tonight is the night to ask and, and explore slightly beyond the options, the very thoughtful, considered options that I deeply appreciate Libby and your team coming up with, but maybe just to see if there is some way that we can find a tiny little way to thread this needle that would allow us to give us the time to do the deliberation that I think this kind of a decision deserves. Um, thank you very much, Mia. Um, I, I really appreciate what, what you just had to say, um, what our fellow board members and community members have had to say prior to, to that. Um, some of the, I've been fervently jotting down keywords um, as I'm listening to you all. Um, 
I think Tim was the first to, to suggest, and then and then Mia, you reiterated the importance of not being overreactive. Um, I think I I think there was a I know there was a very clear message um, in the way that that folks voted, um, but also the way that folks have been reaching out since they voted to say this is the first time that they voted no for a school budget. And the reason was that we did not have any plan for um, for RVS um, and for the, the Roxbury students um, being educated here. Um, I, I, I think, Jim, you mentioned there were a lot of soft yeses on the budget. I've, I've had six yeses say they would vote no the second time mm -hmm. if RVS stays the same. I the, the private conversations, but that doesn't make me feel good. I also have seen countless messages, both to the board and and individually, folks who voted no because we didn't have a plan, um, because there hadn't been a discussion about what we should be doing, um, and and a lot of folks in Montpelier and in Roxbury have said to to us. Um, Take the time, be be deliberative, um, don't make rash decisions. And 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 I was even before today, um, sort of on sympathetic to that. And and I just want to pause for a moment and share a little anecdote from my from my morning. Uh, I was on a, a meeting um, at my house, so I have the luxury one to be able to work from my house. Um, the school nurse called from UES to let me know that my daughter had an accident. Um, that was about 11.35, and before noon, I was in the nurse's office with my daughter. And at that moment, I thought of, if I was an RVS parent, and I got a call that my daughter was in the nurse, would I be in the, the nurse's office within 15 minutes, if that student was was in, um, in, uh, um, excuse me, in Montpelier. Um, and so I thought for a moment, again, about the luxury I had, I have, right, that I live less than a mile, or a mile from, from the, the elementary school, right? And so I don't take conversations about closing down the school lightly. Um, and so to your question or your call to think beyond the, the options, Libby, that thankfully you've presented. Um, I, right off the bat, one, I mean, this is not going to be a surprise, like we set aside $400,000 for the track. We have used 50000 I cannot in all good conscience consider improving a track with that 350000 left at the same time as closing the school. And so those are the types of um, creative additional decisions that I think we as a board need to consider. And so to, to Tim's point, I do think reconsidering all of the fund balance, the known impacts that we have on that, yes, there are things coming down the, the line, but, but we do have knowledge about some things. We have to make the decision based on the information that we have. Right. And so, Tim, I very much agree with you. I don't know that spending all... 2.1 million is wise, and Libby, you're probably um, you know not happy with any of that because it's helpful to have that cushion. And I, I still think that in some part that cushion that we've been able to, to to build up over the last five six years is as a result of the merger, and we owe it to our community to take a deliberative process, use that cushion to to to. To, um, I'm just rambling now, so I'm just going to stop and say, um, but let's be let's be um, deliberate in in our discussions and in our actions. Okay. Um, thank you for coming, um, and I really appreciate hearing about your community and your school. Um, to be honest, um, I think a budget that um, uses all of our savings up to lower tax rates is probably not likely to pass. A budget that makes major 
cuts to the Montpelier schools, um, it's also probably not likely to pass. That's that's what I think based on people I talk to and and things I read. Um, and also, also um, I was with many other members of the of the board a few weeks ago. Um, before town meeting day, thinking this can't be a rush process. This has to be take a while to get this right. And so that is the budget that we presented originally. It was, yes, a huge tax increase, but we're going to take our time to figure out what to do with Roxbury Village School. That's, that's what we did, and that was the best path forward. It, it got rejected. So those are the those pieces. Um, I also want, I, I work in the state government, I'm not at Joint Fiscal Office, which is the legislature staff. I work at the tax department, so Sorry, with Kate. the administration. Um, and I'm glad Representative Hooper is here today. <laughs> um, so with Act 46, um, you know, it says in the intent of the law that it's not to close small schools. But to be totally honest, again, I think it's lame that they would form these districts consolidate knowing that the purpose, the implicit purpose is to close small schools, but they didn't have the guts to do it, so they want us to do it. And that's messed up. <laughs> Seven years later, you get Act 127, which is what's making our tax rate explode in Montpelier. And in that bill, they say, hey, wait a second. These small rural schools cost more to educate students, so we need to actually increase ta the tax capacity towards them. Okay, fine, but we don't we don't benefit from that because Roxbury's demographics are blended with Montpelier, so the small school in the rural area is not getting the weights it deserves. So that's strike number two, another mistake. S strike number three is they wrote in a phase in for Act 127, a way to protect the districts who were really disadvantaged by it, like Montpelier, that they figured out in February didn't actually work and had some serious consequences for the education fund. So in the middle of February, they tried to fix it. After but we warned our budget. After we warned our budget, after we worked on our budget for months and months, after we came here and talked to you a couple times, and we said we're not thinking about closing Roxbury Village School this year because there's no tax implications. We said that. But then in February, whatever, 22nd, they passed this bill that all of a sudden made it the case that we had, we, we did again have control over our taxes and we had to reduce our budget to avoid a huge tax hike. It's all messed up, but that is the landscape. So those are the, some technical things. Um, Rhett already mentioned the, the last one. Um, and I would like to offer you a personal thing. Um, I mentioned at the beginning of the meeting that I have a student who goes to UES, Union Elementary School in Montpelier. Um, he's a wild little guy. Um, he, uh, he, I don't know where his personality comes from exactly, um, <laughs> but when he was in preschool, they wanted to kick him out because he threatened to kill other students, you know, which I don't, I don't know, not that bad, but they thought it was bad. They said that, that he should maybe get kicked out of preschool. Um, we resisted that. Um, but then he went to kindergarten at UES, and he had the most amazing patient teacher who was so wonderful that it blew my mind. Um, and then for first grade, he has an award-winning teacher who started the eco program. Um, and he writes these nasty little notes, and she takes pictures of them and sends it to us, and we're, we talk to him about it. But she's amazing. Um, and we feel so lucky that we, that our son gets to go to that school. Um, I'm sorry that it's so far away. But it's an amazing school, and it's got great teachers and great staff, a great superintendent, and a school board who really cares about the students. So, um, so it that's that's all I have. Should you open back up for public comment? Do folks want to say? Yeah, everyone. Yeah.
Yeah, please. Go ahead. Like French. It's been 40 years since I took high school calculus, but this is based on math, I think. The budget's about $28 million. 10% of that is $2.8 million. 5% is $1.4 million. That looked like what we were spending on the office of the principals. $1.4 million. That used to be the budget for the entire Roxbury School operating budget. So 5% is 1 20th of the total budget. It's more of your staffing budget. So if I had to limit my access to 20 educational staff, the principal's office wouldn't even make the list. Think about 1.4 million could keep this open. I don't know what a principal does other than hand out tardy slips. You know, um, I didn't see a single cut listed in any of the options to that large department of 5% and $1.4 million. Plenty of cuts to the staff that actually do the teaching, but nothing on the principal and assistant principal. What value do they add to the test scores of the students? It's the, I would argue it's the teachers that do. Um, so there's no, no cuts on that. Um, you know, you're looking at cutting club funds in the order of $15,000 with $1.4 million being paid on salaries, I would think that a principal's department would step up and cover those as just a, I'm going to reduce my salary by that amount to continue to fund these things. I don't know how a department like that gets so high that it's 1 20th of your total operating budget and, you know, 1 15th of your staffing. I didn't have my calculator here to do that number. Um, one other thing. So I loved your point about, um, you know, if you work in Roxbury and getting to, or live in Roxbury and getting to the school for an emergency. Think about residents in Roxbury, like I've done before, who work 40 minutes south of here in Bethel and getting from your work in Bethel to Montpelier. You know, or you've got to pick up your kid because he's sick that day. Um, you know, those kinds of kinds of things. Um, so I just I'm very disappointed. I appreciate all the work that you've done. I know this can't be easy. But to see the budget and to not see any cuts in that department and the admin, I don't know if they're untouchable or what that is. I can't fathom that we had principals and assistant principals in this schoolhouse knowing that I was taught, you know, grades one through three were taught by one teacher and four through six were taught by another teacher with some part-time student aides. And like I said, maximum of four cars, teaching 90 students at one point, I think. Um, it's just, I'd like to hear from the board why that department hasn't been looked at. That's $1.4 million. I know you can't cut it to zero, but could that, could, could you eliminate a couple of those positions and cut it to a six hundred thousand dollar budget. You know that's more than you've got in your reserve fund, right? Or, or would significantly improve that. You know, again, staff is much easier to flex based upon student enrollment and population. You're not opening this building back up if Roxbury balloons to a hundred students or one hundred fifty students. You know, if we're successful in revitalizing the town. And I'm hearing a lot of silence well, about that budget. Okay, I'll, I'll yield the floor then. Yeah, and the transportation is just, it's terrible. Because I don't have kids, but I'd want to be right there when my kid got hurt. And, you know, maybe they are going to be permanently paralyzed because they got injured on the football field. And they're at the hospital. And I can't get there because they're that far off. And I happen to have to work south of here. Thank you. Jim, I have a question about process. Sure. Generally, during public comment, we don't respond, but it seems like maybe we could answer questions that people yeah, have. So that because questions. time's running out, <laughs> you know? Yeah, we can definitely answer questions. Um, I just wanted to, from my perspective, answer your question um, on the, the administrative in our schools. 
our principals do an awful lot more than hand out tardy slips. An awful lot more. We have one of the benefits that I have of having kids in the school and being able to have this inside look that I've had on the board for the last three and a half years is to see how incredibly hard our principals are working on being learning leaders in our schools and really driving the culture of learning in our schools. And our assistant principals, we ask them to do all of the like conflict resolution and working and, and looking into when somebody says, hey, I think I'm being bullied right now. They do a very thorough and very taxing and very hard process to look into, is that really the case and what should we do about it if it is? And so I just wanted to take a moment to say our principals and assistant principals are real leaders in our schools. That might not be the case all over America, but we are really lucky <laughs> to have the people we have leading our schools right now. And I'm not trying to sound, I really hope I don't sound defensive in answering your question. I just question if they do more work than teachers do, and if it's worth $1.4 million, I, I, 20%. They do different work. They do different they do work. Different they work. do different they do work, different work and, that and, is I think we should, and I think we should honestly entertain any question people are bringing, because now is the moment, if we're not going to do what I would like to do, which is make a more de have, take a more deliberative approach to this, I really think we should honestly entertain any question somebody has. And my perspective on your question is that they do... Yes, different work than our teachers, but they have a big job. There's yeah, the, also a statute requirement that principals need to have their contracts renewed by February 2nd. Which means, it's already, which means it's already happened. Which means it might be something to consider for an FY26 or future budget if declining enrollment happens. Maybe we don't need that many administrators, but it's not something we can consider for the FY25 budget. Yeah, and I just want to add, the, the average tenure for a principal is three years. The burnout rate is very high. It is one of the hardest jobs an individual can have. And, and they do wonderful work. Can I also say that the principal in this school from, awesome. from September to December, in September there were kids meeting the standard in reading at 40%, or excuse me, if there were 70% of kids were not meeting the standard, right? And then in December, it was 45% were meeting the standard, so it was a, a swing of 25%. Is that... Is that... Go ahead. Is that... Hi, Katie. It was 42% for meeting standard in the beginning of the year, and it went up to 70%. So, thank you. Thank you. That didn't sound right when I said it, but a, ma a massive increase, right? A massive increase in only three months. And that is... That's... Yes, because there was very little other change except for the, the previous. Hi, I'm the principal. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Shannon Miller. I'm just to, I've said this before here. I do teach here. So I'm a teaching principal. That's appropriate for a school of this size. Um, so I teach literacy here. I teach math here. I also want to say I'm not the only principal in this district that has done this. Our middle school principal has been a math teacher all year because they didn't have one. So these principals, all of them and AP, step in regularly to make sure that they're in our classrooms, our superintendent is in our classrooms, and we are in the classrooms. I actually am never in my office. <laughs> and I'm a teacher here, and she does drive a lot of the, the literacy of yeah. what we need to do. And sometimes I drive the bus when we don't have one. <laughs> <laughs> It's 5% of the salary line yeah. in the budget. It is not 5% of the budget. It's 5% of the salary. The pie chart showed the whole budget. No, the, that pie chart showed salary and benefits. That was just salaries? Yes. There was one that showed the whole budget. The next one showed just the salaries and benefits. Miss Heidi Albright, um, I first want to say thank you to these two excellent people who have done a fantastic job of representing our community. I'm sorry, I'm very emotional. Um, I also want to thank you for responding to my email today. You're the only one who did, and I really valued hearing back from someone 
because I felt heard. I want to thank Mia and Tim for what you said earlier. I want to encourage the whole board to please find a way to give us one more gear to figure out how our community can move forward from here. Without our school, we have families that will be really struggling. This isn't, this isn't equitable. To listen to only the loudest voices coming from Montpelier means you're not hearing. We're, we're kind of quiet in Roxbury until it comes right down to defending our kids and our way of life here. We really, really need the time. And if there's a way, a creative way, to dig a little deeper into that fund, let's try. I think our community deserves it. I think our kids deserve it. It's just, it's just not right to close the school without giving us time to prepare. Thank you. Speak one more time. Um, I, yeah, thank you. Um, I just wanted to reiterate that you guys weren't the only ones calling each other and texting at nine o'clock at night over the weekend. We had hundreds of phone calls. The power was out here all weekend. We were running generators. We were calling. We were texting. We had 32 people on a Zoom call last night when the town didn't have power. Folks were rationing their batteries for two days and running generators just to log in. We did some huge heavy lifting. I can tell you that three days ago, no one would have been telling you, just give us one more year. Like That was a really painful place for people to get to. That's not what we wanted, you know, that people want this town to have a school. We did a lot of work. We came to you in a spirit of really, really uh, sacrificing, really. Like we brought to you the best possible deal we could come up with. And we're just asking you to please hear that. Please give us one year. You are hearing from folks, the busing is not working. <laughs> like it may, seeing busing eliminated on there is terrifying. Like that's just a deal breaker. Kids are coming to school hungry. They're exhausted. They're cold. You know, they've missed breakfast. They're late to class. They've been standing on the side of a highway. They're getting dropped off three, four miles away from home. You know, sometimes without their parents, like kids get on the bus accidentally when they forget that they're supposed to go to an after school activity and they get left on the side of a highway and there's no phones, there's nowhere to call, you know, there's no cell service. So we've got to figure out the busing and if it was easy, you would have done it already. So give yourselves the time to get it right. You're going to really hurt people. You know, you don't want to hear about accidents. You don't want kids getting hit on the side of the bus, uh, the side of the highway. That's what you, it's a real risk. So give yourselves time to do this thing right and recognize that we will partner with you. And if you can give us the time, we will be your allies in the community and we will make sure that these relationships are not damaged forever. You know, we're still healing from the merger years ago that has created divides in this community that we're still working to merge and to heal. And so just please, it's not just the building we're talking about when we talk about revitalizing Roxbury, it's the community. And there is already harm here and we're trying really hard to repair it, but we really need you guys to be our allies here. So please, can you come back with a budget that doesn't talk about everything as cuts, but deferring for one year? Can you dig deep for one year? I think you can, I think you can really sell that to your Montpelier constituents. There's a great example on Front Porch porch forum today from Northfield. You know, the Northfield PTO really went to bat for their budget and they talked about why they thought this budget was so lean and it was so good. That's a great example of something that we could do as well, right? But we, you know, I think you can market this. I think you can sell it to the Montpelier folks that one year and then they won't have this expense to worry about anymore. And I think they will support that. I don't think you need to be quite so dramatic as cutting it right away. So thank you very much for listening to us all. It really means a lot to us that you all came out here tonight.
getting tired of hearing my uh, my voice at these meetings. I hear some positive things from board members about what our people have asked for. They've put a lot of effort into putting this presentation together to get one more year. Well, I don't think one more year is good enough. As several people have said tonight, we had a two-room school here and graduated great kids, one through six, in two rooms. And now they say small schools don't fly. They don't work. It's because state law has changed and changed and changed to the point where really nothing works. I mean, you all think UES is the be-all and end-all. And it may be today, but you don't know about tomorrow. And you don't have, I don't think, any right to bus our kids, five-year-old kids, from Roxbury to, to uh, from Steel Hill, let's say, or from Thurston Hill here in Roxbury, to Montpelier. I went back and, re and reread all the minutes from the merger committee. And I could see right from the very beginning that the handwriting was on the wall, that this school was not going to last more than four years. In fact, Miss Muncie, I think her name is, she proposed that it not be closed after four years. And then later on, she changed that and said, oh, no, it has to close absolutely after four years. And we have to have the option. You have the option to close the school. You don't have to listen to us. You don't have to have any input. You don't have to have anything. You nine people have all the power. We have none. We gave that up last July when the town vote was taken away. So really, everybody that gets up here thanks you and thanks what a great job you've done and how hard you've worked. Well, I'm Mr. Negativity. I don't think you have done a good job. You presented a budget in the very beginning that was a 12% increase. And then you got sucker punched by the state and turned it into a 24%. And then somebody put out there, and I think it was the superintendent, that it cost $1.8 million or $1.5 million to run the Roxbury School. Well, of course Montpelier is going to jump on that. They're like a robin on a worm, you know. They knew damn well that they wanted to close the school. They didn't want to close the school, but they wanted an easy way out. And that's what you gave them. And they've been playing with that number ever since. And the main driver is this guy, Richard Shear. I have no idea who he is or what he does or what his background is, but he's taken that number and run with it. Except that in his op-ed in the bridge, he said the actual savings, if you close Roxbury School, is only $465,000. It's not $1.5 million. But yet everybody in Montpelier has $1.5 stuck in their brain, and they can't get it out because they don't want to think about it. They just want to get rid of Roxbury, save 1.5, and be done with it. They're not looking down the road to next year. Who are you going to get rid of next year when you have a budget shortfall? You know? You tell me. Roxbury alone, for our little school, Mike mentioned it earlier, $522,000 from the district, but we pay the district for this little school. $522,000. And if you close the school, that $522,000 is going to go right back to Montpelier and they're going to pay it. We've been paying your debt. I've said this before. We had zero debt when we went into this merger. And we signed on to our part of the $6 million debt. And we've been making debt payments ever since. It's like paying for a car, you know. But it's, this one is unfortunately running without any tires. You guys, you know, you haven't really done the job that you should have done. You gave a, a huge increase to the teachers because, oh, they had so hard a time in COVID. Well, I got news for you. Everybody had a hard time in COVID. And then... On top of that, you've got a teacher's contract that is causing this deadline that we're faced with tonight. 
because you have, have to give out RIF notices in a short period of time. Now I just hear that the principals get their contracts in February. No contract should ever be signed that before town meeting because you have no idea what's going to happen at town meeting. That just guarantees those people their, their pay. There's no chance of cutting, cutting anything in their, in their situation. You've got, I don't know, 10 people in the school system making well over $100,000 a year. And yet you get an 8% increase. And you should have known that the, that the health insurance was going to go up 16%. I mean, that's a failing on your part, I believe. And so that's what that's partially what's put us under the bus. That and, and throwing out this $1.5 million figure that people just cannot get out of their head. Just can't do it. It's like it's like Seeing somebody squashed on, on the highway and, and it's in your he head forever. You just can't get rid of it. And I fault you for that, the board, for not taking, taking the position that that was not necessarily the way we want to go and just rolling over to Richard Shear and his 400 cohorts and throwing this school right down the drain. And the village along with it. Because like, you look at this audience. How many young people are here with kids? Do you think they would have moved here if there wasn't a school? I mean, they, I don't know. Well, it's a, it's a good question. All right, thank you. I've already spoken, so I won't speak if someone else wants to speak. Yeah, okay, definitely. I'm Ophelia, and I'm in third grade. And, and I'm Hazel, and I'm in third grade also. Um, so what's your last name, sweetheart? Brian. Um, and this, we know that a, a bunch of these kids in the school, this school means a lot t to them. And me and Ophelia will spend all the money in our piggy banks if this school can stay open. Um, a lot of kids think it's special to have a school here because it has not too many students. And it's really fun to be at. All the teachers are really great, and I'd be pretty bummed if the school was closed. That's all. My name is Jim Rogler. Um, I have no kids in the school system. <laughs> Long gone. Um, I was looking, and I'm going a little bit by memory, your expense pie charts up there. Um, and one of them, I believe, said labor was roughly 52%. Is that close? Salaries. Salary. Does that include benefits or not? No. Salaries and benefits is approximately 75%. Okay. Um, so I worked in a, several financial positions for several corporations, so I'm part of the evil corporation. You guys can put that on, I can be on your ass list for that. But anyway, part of the, the largest component of our expenses was labor. Same thing here, right? And I saw you had cuts for um, teachers, right, which is probably a tough one to do. Am I correct? Does that... Um, are these, is this part of attrition, or are these no new hires, or no new backfills, or how is it, how's it, how's it playing out? Uh, yes. <laughs> All the above? Um, yeah, so we have, um, 
So when you see two FTE, uh, both of those could be accomplished through attrition. Okay. Um, so and we would eliminate that position, but nobody would be filling it next year, okay. or nobody would be in it to rip. And that's what is that what the majority was? I think you had six. I don't remember all the options up there, but when we start getting to six FTE in our teaching staff, then that is not all through attrition. Okay. Um, so the no new hires and things like that. Now is that Roxbury and Montpelier schools? That's everybody. It's across. The, so our our teaching staff is under one un, one union. It doesn't matter what building they work in. Um, but rifts happen according to licensure category. Okay. So it could be. So let's say um, an English teacher at the high school decides to move to Colorado, um, and we we can't riff a K-6 teacher and say it's taken care of by the English teacher leaving because it's a different licensure category. Okay. My, my, where I'm going is I think labor obviously is a huge, and Tom mentioned, I can't believe what the increase was. Maybe I'm not that close to it. Was it 8% increase? It's 8% for FY25. Okay. Whatever that is. But um, I dare you to mention or find any corporation that's given a percent increase to any of their workers generally and if corporations aren't doing well which seems to be the case right and i know a lot of stuff was thrown on you in the last seconds um what's commonly done and what you're doing this is some cuts in people which is a hard thing to do um to try to balance the budget and apparently you're doing that which i so i commend you on that which is not an easy thing to do I guess I'm curious, my, where I'm going with this is, um, have you looked at, at all the possibilities for this type of, because it's the biggest expense you have, right? That, and apparently the busing isn't so great, but that's got to be a pretty huge expense for you all, too. And I would implore you, which I think was echoed by most of you guys, don't rush into something like this. I mean, I'm... I've been in town for 30-something years, um, and I understand the importance of the school and the community. And we got a great bunch of young families here, and um, it probably could be my kids, for that matter. But I think the positive energy that these people are bringing to town, I'd hate to see them get kicked in the gut with this. Um, and your husband and, and the group over there, and we're slightly involved, and we do, we do what we can, but please don't make any rash decisions here because these guys move through the community. Roxbury is a really cool place, nice and rural. We don't have some of the issues maybe that Montpelier have, but we other ones we have. <laughs> okay. Every town has this situation. So I would implore you, and Tim, great job in your description. Let's be real sure about this. And it's not going to impact. I'm going to be long gone probably by the time this really hits the town. But you also mentioned future thoughts and where we're going with this. And my right, wife runs a B&B. &B. We get more people, especially post-COVID, from Boston and New York who just want to sit on our back porch. Okay? We can look. Or they complain, how can you sleep here? It's so quiet. Or you need more street lights out there. Well, that's why people come here, right? To get away from that kind of stuff. So I don't have a lot of skin in the game, but I do please, um, and you, I think you guys have explained yourselves well, and I haven't been too involved in this, but I implore you, don't make a mistake uh, in hustling through this thing because of some legislative issues that you had no control over, and I, I didn't either. So hoping for the best. Jenkins, terrified to be sitting here. Sorry. Courtney Jenkins, Sorry. I just had a suggestion and I have no idea how the system currently works, so forgive me if I'm misunderstanding, but is there any way to offer some sort of a benefit if we were to keep the school open one more year um, for the teachers who were to stay to then have a position at a Montpelier school afterwards to incentivize them to stay for the year that we maybe were open one more year? Thanks. 
You can go back to your seat if you want to, or you can say it's fine, either one. <laughs> Looks like you're anxious to end. Um, it's it's seniority, right? So any kind we have we have teaching riffs, they go by seniority as to when somebody was hired. Um, so there is no promising positions for one more year because we're in a unionized contract. Um, it's so anything is based on seniority. Yeah, and also getting to your suggestion, which I think was maybe reconsidering the 8%. The 8% is also governed by contract and it's a contract you agree to. I also s stand very strongly behind the 8%. Uh, it's, uh, our teachers deserve it. They do a great job. Um, and I know Joe has the figures on the top of his head. Even with the 8% increase, most of the districts around us gave similar increases. We are in about the middle of the pack in terms of our competitiveness with that 8% increase with uh, surrounding districts and obviously if there was a possibility of bringing that down, it would make us less competitive, which would, you know, which would mean that we would probably lose people. Go online. Um, anyone else in the room before I go online? Yes. Uh, I'm Edgar Mosquita. Um, I don't have any skin in the game anymore. Uh, uh, my kids left for college. Um, one of them is working at. Uh, Burlington High School as a construction management. My main thing is we were forced into the merger and this is not for mainly for the board, it's more like a venting. We were forced into a merger, then we were forced into equity and now we're being forced to not have equity because our kids have to be in the bus, you know. When they forced the merger, the state said, we'll give you a little bit of a discount on your taxes. That discount will go down. And the first year, the taxes dropped a little bit, not much. But from then on, it's been a kick in the teeth. Every year, the taxes go up. And every, ta every year goes up. And it's not sustainable in that sense. We're not attracting more young people by doing that. And by not attracting more young people, we lose kids in our schools. And by losing kids in our schools and families in here, we get screwed on the tax bracket. And I would use a much stronger word on that sentence. So I think it's, it's not, your budget is not somewhat of the problem. I think the legislature is the problem. Just like you guys said before, you, ha you got thrown a curveball by having a change in law in February, you know. I think that a lot of the negative votes for the budget was a representation of that, that they're not happy with what's going on in Montpelier, not with your school, but with, this, with the legislature. And I think that won't change a lot of the mentality because they will always think that you guys are doing a terrible job. You're not. You're trying to balance a budget that it's $30 million. I'm sorry, you know, we'll all suffer. But, um, I think the we should all force the legislature to come up with an actual solution to a problem that we knew that we were going to have 10 years ago. Population decline, aging, and as people age, fixed incomes, they're going to vote no because they can't afford it. And our tax went from 2,800 to what it is now, 5,500. So that's all I'm saying. <laughs> Thank you for your work. And please keep the school open. Give us a year. It's rushed if we close anything. OK? Thank you. Is there anyone else in the room that I think of? Yeah, I'll go one last time, even though I've testified many a time. My name is Ben Pincus. Uh, I'm also a proud graduate. I've mentioned this before with uh, Mike. When Roxbury Village School was a two-room schoolhouse, raise your hand in this room when you went to the school as a two-room schoolhouse. Maybe no one. Okay. But then raise your hands if you went. You did? Our children. Your children did. That's right. Raise your hand if you went to Roxbury Village School. A couple more hands. Great. Awesome. So uh, just super quick, um, just because I don't get a chance to quote it much, my third grade Christmas pageant um, was right there. Um, 
Uh, I'm, I'm going to try to remember it. Um, Here with everyone must go to the place where he has been born to be counted and recorded by the order of the emperor. So my acting skills didn't grow, I admit. Um, but my sense of social justice and also curiosity, that was, of course, the story of King Herod which in the slaughter of the innocents, which wasn't very accurate. But that being said, historic, the, we won't go into biblical, biblical history in two minutes. But I just want to mention that at Roxbury Village School, what is so special about small rural schools like this is that the teachers really fostered a genuine sense of curiosity. And I think a genuine sense of, of social justice came with that curiosity. And so I think what this really comes down to in the end is our ability to advocate for this, this school um, is for us to go to Montpelier, to reach out to people of Montpelier in any way we can. This is your school budget, so hopefully you could also advocate for maybe that compromise of the 16%. Um, and also what I heard, I think you had mentioned that if there is a plan and if that plan does necessitate the closure of Roxbury Village School in one year, I hate to frame it that way, but perhaps between those things, a reduced tax cut from 24% to 16%, advocacy on the part of all of you, public forum. Um, I know, um, Jim, I know you, you went to the forum with uh, Richard Shear, and I was just wondering if you folk or any one of you would be willing to also be an, sort of an expert witness or to clarify things. And if perhaps we, the Roxbury folk, could ha also have a public forum, perhaps at the library in Montpelier. Um, and perhaps, and just one more thing, um, I've reached out to some folks, some friends in Montpelier, and they have been swayed when they hear what is actually happening and when they hear advocacy on the part of Roxbury people. So it is possible um, to meet folk halfway. I think ideally there would be polling, right, if we had more time and more money for that. Um, what would Montpelier voters take? Um, but anyway, I just want to put that word out that in the end, um, here with everyone must go to the capital city of Montpelier and uh, do our work for advocacy. Thank you. My name is Katie Swick, and I'm the kindergarten teacher here at Roxbury. I also have a student at UES and an MSMS student, eighth grader. And um, I love working here. I think we have a wonderful team. I love the small school and the, and the students. And I, I went to a small school as a child in Maine. Um, and I know UES is a good school. MS, MS is a great school. The kids will get a great education there. I also know the benefits of kids going to a small school and what they gain at a small school in the community here. Um, and so, right, this whole situation, I feel both sides of it, being a Montpelier resident, working here at Roxbury, it's very challenging to be in the situation. Um, and I know that I'll have a job either way, and I know but not all my coworkers will. And I can't speak for all my coworkers, but it's definitely stressful over the last few months, as you all have enjoyed the stress too, if you want to put it that way. I guess that's not the right way to put it. But um, yeah, it's stressful not knowing what's going to be happening next year or the year after. Um, and that's hard working here. Of course, we continue to put all our best into the the students and we know how to be flexible here um, and we'll figure it out but um, I guess I just want to I don't know what my message is I don't even know where I stand I guess is my point anymore because it's so hard to be thinking about all the situations so I also appreciate your work and uh, thank you That's all. Just a quick thought I just had, Mike French. Um, there was discussion about it may be difficult to find staff to take a position at the Roxbury School for one year. And being a new hire, they would lose their job because they don't have seniority. What I would advocate for 
is to try to find the most senior folks in Montpelier, see if they would be willing to transition for a year. So there is no worry of job loss should the school close in a year. It sounds like Montpelier is a very attractive place for teachers. So you should have no trouble filling positions in the Montpelier district with a new teacher. The challenge is finding a teacher in Roxbury. Doesn't mean that you don't put in the work to do that. We can be creative about who you put here so that they don't lose their job. And you, you may have Roxbury teachers here that have low seniority that would be willing to make the transition already to Montpelier and you just swap some staff. Don't know if contracts allow that or if you'd have to incentivize it, but I'm sure there are some teachers that possibly came from a small town like Roxbury that would be willing to make that move to make this happen for an additional year. Thank you. Heather Holter, um, I have a just about ready to graduate senior at Montpelier High School, um, and uh, and another um, uh, out in California who graduated a couple of years ago. Um, I I just want to say that the how, whatever happens. The how needs a lot of work. And, and Rhett said it really well when he talked about equity. Um, my two high school students did not find the transition to Mount Pelier High School easy. They, didn't, they, didn't, they weren't seen by everyone. They were seen by wonderful people. But they weren't seen universally and helpfully as from a, another community that's part of their school district. So from my opinion, uh, or from my observation, from the merger until now, we have been really doing a, a pretty terrible job at the how we merge two communities that are 20 miles apart. This was, we knew this wasn't going to be easy. Um, but we did sign on to do it. And we could be doing a lot better. And we're going to have to do a lot better because we're talking about really little kids now whose lives will be shaped. I mean. I am willing to bet everyone in this room has a memory from elementary school that actually shaped decisions they made as a parent. I have a couple growing up in a, a small town in Wisconsin. So my point is that no matter whether we're talking about a year or three months or a couple of years, we have merged two communities. And if we're going to stay merged, we have to figure out how to merge with, with respect for the diversity of these two communities. And I am a person who ran my generator to watch your four hour school board meeting from last week because I couldn't watch it last week. And well, Montpelier had power. So the entire experience of most of your school children is completely different than this small population. You have got to figure out how to deal with that if we're gonna stay merged like wherever, whatever buildings we're in. So my plea is really just about how. And I would also say that you have, the legislature is who I, and I, you know, Jay already knows who I am, but like they've the, they're the ones that we need to go to to say this is not okay with us. And in my opinion, you have an ability and you've got two shots at this if I, you know, took good enough notes when I was watching the four hour meeting from last time. So why do we have to go, you know, I guess my point is you could make an attempt to see what the voters will go for and then, you know, you do it all over again. I know there are huge implications for that, but there are huge implications for this too. So I would just encourage you to be creative. And I was here when the merger was happening saying the same thing. Can't we be creative? Like, I moved to Vermont 25 years ago thinking this was, you know, there are a lot of creative people here. I've been super disappointed in the legislature. And I've been super disappointed in the way schools deal with what they've been thrown. thrown. Like, we can be more creative. We can be more thoughtful about our values and what's important. So I would just encourage you to do that. And I don't know 
what that will end up being, but whatever ends up being put in front of the voters next time, we've already screwed up by making it about Roxbury Village School is the problem. So you've already got a lot of work to do to undo that. And if you don't think that every 5 to 18 year old who's in your school system from Roxbury is impacted by that, you are mistaken. So I think that is my plea, the how. Let's do the how better. Thank you. said don't clap for me when I showed up is because indeed this is all the fault of the legislature. The truest thing from a legislative perspective said tonight was that, that it wasn't the political courage when Act 46 was passed to do this hard work ourselves. This was probably inevitable. And I wouldn't say it's a conspiracy of the Montpelier community to at some point within one to five years shut this down, this building down for certain. That's maybe not reasonable, but the, the point is that these legislative um, directives are going to continue to come because consolidation will have to continue. I mean, we're, we're, lock, we're talking about education spending always going up. That is probably always to be true, right, for reasons that are beyond our control. A 16% increase in healthcare costs across the state, you know, for Montpelier to be contending with 75% in costs to faculty and administration and, and, and personnel, that is a high number, but it is true in all districts that it's more than 50%. And this notion that when property taxes, when, when you know, education spending goes up, property taxes do too. That is also a fact, but that's one fact that needs to change. And that's a failure of the legislature. And I'm really hoping that this year, because of this pressure, not just in this scenario, this is a particularly difficult one right here between your two communities, um, will give us the, the spur that we need to actually dig into changing you know, Act 127 was not the wrong thing to do. It was probably rolled out the wrong way, though. I mean, equity is something that we should be in hot pursuit of. But if the formula itself will become so expensive that it actually becomes, that it implodes, it becomes bankrupt, then we do not have this democracy anymore. You know, what's the worst case scenario? In my mind, it would be private interests come and buy up our school system. Then we don't get to decide how we educate children. So I say to Tom, for example, you know, these folks maybe didn't do it perfectly, but blame the legislature sooner than these than these good servants. Because they're doing their best. I mean, I hope I hope. And we aren't. We are not in the in in the Capitol building. So I I too encourage this board. Uh, to really think strongly about what it looks like to go to 16%, whatever the compromise has to look like, where you got to borrow money from, maybe we can try and figure out how to compensate you. I'm sure Libby will be testifying again in House Education soon. And, um, you know, these are discussions that we have to really start to have in earnest sooner than later. Uh, but, you know, like I say, we have a formula that we know it doesn't work. It functions, but it becomes more and more expensive every year, and it has been for so many years running that the consensus out there, voters in Vermont, all across, up and down, Vernon to Albert, will tell you that property taxes are too high, and they continue to climb. And the irony here is that one... 27 was a product of Act 175, which included in it a study committee which came out with a report in 
December of 2022, which is a lot, a lot of days ago, what it looks like to go to an income-based formula so we can continue to use the mathematics that we have, the variables by which we determine how to equalize per pupil spending from district to district. That can still exist, but we need to figure out a different way to come up with that money. Can I interrupt you right there? Please, Rick. Can we think about applying the, the equation by town and not by district? We sure. Yeah. We because sure there's can. a lot of big there's a lot of big districts with a lot of different towns with a lot of different demographics, and when you you know if you want equity, it just needs to focus in a little bit more because this has been the opposite of equity for us. And I know the intention of the law, but no, when absolutely. you that just the, it can it can zero in a little bit. And also true was what Rhett said earlier, which is that we passed a law to try and create more equity across the map, to, to stimulate equity, to, to levelize opportunity for students, no matter what they look like, where they come from. Um, but then we turn around and say, oops, we just realized that this is going to be an absurd, it is absurd to ask a school district to pay 20, one fourth of what they paid last year additional. 25, 24% is absolutely absurd. And we did that to do, we did this, H 850 was a band-aid to like try and encourage school districts to go back to, to, to get people who build budgets to go back and do their work over. It's just also ridiculous to do that. So I guess what I mean to say when I stand here is um, keep working and the thing that I'm trying to do is, is help my colleagues understand just how true this is. Like the political will needs to be cultivated to like go a totally different direction. We don't have to abandon the good work that a lot of smart people did in recent years, but we do really need to shift gears. And before I leave, let me ask you all a question. Who here believes in local control? That's a joke. It's a joke. It's a myth. It doesn't yeah, exist. Totally. <laughs> there are no two budgets. We believe in it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Don. Yeah, believe it. But there are no two budget votes that don't indirectly impact another district's tax rates. That concept by itself is unsustainable. And it's like you said it best. We just, I was in college when that, I'd like to claim that I wouldn't have voted for Act 46. I probably wouldn't have, but I'm really not sure. I wasn't there. I did vote for 127 because I was told that we're working on it, right? But here we are talking about 2025, 20, 26 figures. And, you know, we've known. You know, anybody who says, oh, we didn't know, or like, it was, there's too much data we're waiting on. Well, I was quoted in seven days, and I can't reiterate what I said. So, <laughs> I think you know what I mean. So, I appreciate you all listening to me tonight, and uh, do be in touch. I know I'm not very great at responding to emails. My phone number is the best way to get in touch with me. Um, again, Tom Pillier, I hope you have it in your hearts to figure out how to give these guys more time, because they need it. And, uh, carry on. Anyone else in the room, whether it was online, uh, Jim Eikenberry. Hey folks, just checking to see if this is working. Yep, yep. you're good, Jim. Great, all right. <clears throat> Thank you, everyone. I'll try to be brief. Um, I wanna start by saying that, you know, I'm a Montpelier resident. I voted for the budget. I sat through all the meetings and I believe it was a good budget and it's certainly unfair what happened at the last minute with the legislature that um, really, really just put things off the rails. Um, I grew up in a rural community in New York that's not dissimilar to Roxbury. Um, 
and I spent an hour on the bus for every bus ride I ever had. Um, and so I, I know what that experience is like. Um, it sucks. And I still got a phenomenal education getting to go to the, uh, the wealthier suburban community. And um, I think that it frustrates me that we might have to eventually close the Roxbury school. And I'd like to give them as much time as we possibly can, which is another reason I voted for the budget, even though that it's going to personally cost me a lot more money, but I'd, I'd rather invest in children than in other things. Um, and so I think that if at some point we have to close the Roxbury school, then I really want to amplify what Rhett said, because I did not know that we were just dropping kids off at some random locations and it wasn't door to door busing. Um, blue collar family growing up, my parents were always working. And the only way it really worked is that I could walk down our quarter mile driveway, stand at the end of the road, get picked up on the bus and get taken to school and then spend an hour, you know, back on that bus at the end of the day and get dropped off at the end of my driveway, walk the quarter mile back home. And there you go. Um, I think it is unacceptable if we're going to say, hey, we're going to bus your kids to UES and we're going to drop your kids off in these locations that are not right next to their homes. Um, and I think that I think that most people in Montpelier would find that unacceptable and they'd find it in their hearts to dig a little deeper to make it so those kids could have safety. Um, and I think that maybe needs to be part of the sales pitch is that if, if we're if we're going at some point hope we can give them at least another year to you know to have to close that village school which again hope we don't have to do but if we have to um that busing needs to be superior and it needs to be frequent uh one of the best experiences i ever got out of being a rural kid but getting bus to the nicer school was that i got to participate in sports i got to participate in clubs and the only way that worked is because there was an after school bus that allowed us rural kids to actually do a sport, do a club and have a way to get home because my parents are working. There was no way they could have done their jobs and ferried me around anywhere. So if, if we're talking about, you know, at some point that village school has to close, I think we need to have a, a strong commitment to superior busing to really, really make that equity happen. Um, and I, I really hope that um, we could all find a way to dig deep to give Roxbury more time to to have a, a real fair process to figure things out. So for all the folks in the room, please know that not everybody in Montpelier wants to close your school down. Um, a lot of us love your school and grew up rural and uh, really appreciate what that's like. And we, we want to support your community. Thanks, everybody. Uh, it's Jamie Ray, but you know, it might be Parker. It's me this time, Jim. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, I, first of all, I just wanted to, uh, well, first and foremost, a shout out to the student representatives on the board. I've um, all along been thoroughly impressed by you two, and tonight especially uh, blown away by the thoughtfulness of your comments. So great job. Um, a thank you to the entire board and, and, a, and a call out to everyone. It's been hinted at a few in a few different ways tonight, but I just want to really underscore for all my fellow voters. Um, forgive me. I'm, it's James Ray. I have uh, uh, two kids at Montpelier High School. I'm a Montpelier resident. Um, but I want to really underscore uh, for folks the the unbelievably like Swiss cheese of lattice work that this board is having to work through to try to make things work. Picture any of you, for any of us, picture if in doing your daily job, you had what, three or four different bosses, all of whom were layering an, a, a, a bizarre maze of interconnected deadlines and demands on you, none of whom are accountable to each other. That's kind of what our board is fighting against, whether it's the legislature, um, the healthcare system, union contracts, and other things that I'm sure I don't know about. So it's a, it's a mind boggling, maze that these folks are having to work through. Um, and so I just want a, a shout out to the board for that and a shout out to my resident, my fellow voters uh, to um, direct energies that might be frustration aimed at them in other directions. And I'm going to come back to that in a second. 
But what I really also want to encourage folks to do as you see these numbers is to try to see beyond the percentages and really do the math on what it actually means to your taxes. And I, I don't want to be, I'm sure many, if not most folks have already done that, but to, the, to anyone who's sort of seeing these large, scary percentage numbers and not actually doing the math on how it, what it really might translate to, to a monthly bill, for example, um, to go ahead and do that. Because I think some of these numbers, no, none of these increases are comfortable or good for anyone. Uh, and, I know, and I know more so for some than others. Um, but my back of the envelope calculations as Libby was going through option A, B, C, D, and E is that the incredible pain difference to the school district and the schools represented by that scale of going from A down to E, um, huge amounts of increasing pain um, with a not, a not an increasing amount of pain on what would be our monthly bill um, to, to pay for that difference. So my point is, um, I would just really beg folks um, to uh, back away from sort of the scariness of large percentage numbers and really look at what it means to your budget. And then for all of us to try have the courage to go as high as we comfortably can with that number. Um, again, no one wants higher taxes. But for all of us to go as high as we can for that com that number to get the best school that we can for our kids, and I say that on a couple for a couple of reasons. One, and I said this in a previous meeting a few months back, but study after study after study links the quality of a town and the quality of a community to the quality of its schools. So we owe it to ourselves, whether we have kids in that system or not, to ensure the health of our school system. Um, and I would say to, to I think all of us, I, uh, to act as if, the, the quote I would say is, act as if their kids are your kids. And I would say that to all of us Montpelier residents, um, looking at our colleagues and our friends over in Roxbury, because you know we are, we, there's a lot of talk about two communities. Ultimately, we are now one community by, by virtue of our combined school system. And I, I think we owe it to each other to treat ourselves as one community and act as if their kids are your kids um, in, in making these decisions and doing the best we can by all students. Um, and I would say that to the large proportion of, of Montpelier voters who don't have kids in the system, to please act as if their kids are your kids. Um, many of you, uh, if you don't have kids in the system, you probably you might have grandkids, you might have nieces, you might have nephews and other locations. Picture them in these schools and vote accordingly, please. Um, it's it's for the good of the entire community. Um, and then I would just really want to underscore, this is my final point, what's been said tonight, and I really thank that representative for saying this, is to direct the tremendous amount of energy and, and emotional energy and sort of uh, that we all have around this um, toward the powers that are putting this situation in place talk to the, toward the legislator, toward the governor's office, toward, I don't even sure who that we can start to fix the health care costs that are coming down on these boards. But my point is to take the, 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 the political energy that this community has around this topic, um, you know, let the school board know what you're thinking, obviously, but focus any of that, that intense emotional energy on where the problem is really coming from, which is not the school board, it is the legislature. Um, it is the governor's office. It's 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 the healthcare system that's putting us in this bind. So, um, again, thank you all for listening. I apologize if it went on too long. We've got Caitlin Brown. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, hi, I am. Uh, first, I just wanted to thank you all so much for your thoughtfulness on this and all of your hard work. It's incredible what you're doing and what you have to do. And I really appreciate it. Um, I also just wanted to say, you know, I'm a solo parent. I'm a full time student. I also uh, am a school social worker. I intern at UES right now. I have a I have a student, a son that goes to UES. Um, you know, I'm hearing a lot about equity tonight and 
which is ironic considering this legislature that was supposed to be equitable that is really feeling highly inequitable. Um, and I just wanted to uh, be a voice that maybe I really haven't been heard hearing in this conversation. Um, it's a voice of lower income people, renters in Montpelier. Um, you know, I really, really worry about property tax increases at this really high level. I worry about landlords increasing rents to a to a place where it's not attainable. It's not. Um, it doesn't feel feasible. Um, and you know, I also, I just, I just want to say that I, I really appreciated Lynn talking about this last week briefly about the fixed income, and her worry about this same thing. And I, I just really don't feel like it's been in this conversation enough. Um, I also just want to say, you know, it can it can make a really big impact the, these these numbers on lives in our in our communities, and um, you know, with a lot of students that I work with on a daily basis, and it and it worries me a lot. So I just wanted to add that voice to this conversation, and I also just wanted to say, you know, every day being at UES, I see the hard work that the faculty does and the teachers do and how thin stretch they are already with um you know ias and um subs and uh cutting those positions really really worries me also so um i just sort of wanted to add that voice to the conversation thank you so much thank you, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Fran Hello, uh, I'm Fran Dodd. I live in Montpelier. I'm a Montpelier grandparent of one child at uh, one grandchild at UES and another one coming next year <clears throat> to the same school. Um, I want to first uh, express appreciation for all the work you do. I uh, it, I can't even imagine how much time you spend on this. So I appreciate that. A um, couple of things I wanna say, uh, well, several things I wanna say. One is I don't think that we can count on the legislature to improve things within a year. Uh, they made a recent attempt to improve Act 127 and instead it made the budget worse, uh, increase worse in Montpelier who knows what will happen in the uh, near future. Second, um, the emotional decision would be to keep Roxbury open forever, or at least for another year. And I appreciate the, the pull towards that uh, because I, I've been listening the last few boards, board meetings and hearing that. I don't know if that's the best decision uh, for the system as a whole, including the Roxbury students' future. Um, so I think it's very important to make a rational decision about all this. And um, one of the concerns is that I have is the idea of putting a lot of fund balance towards this that you have to then make up next year so that probably means increased property taxes next year to make up for what you don't do this year by keeping the school open this year. Um, Ro Roxbury School, obviously. Um, another concern I have is how much um, would be cut in terms of support staff and other staffing in Montpelier that will affect both the older Roxbury students now and in the near future and would affect what there is to receive Roxbury students next year uh, on the elementary uh, level. Um, I think it's really important to keep a good support staff um, in place because um, there are a lot of very good people who work there now who can um, usher students through. And I, th I imagine 
that at least some of the Roxbury students, uh, teachers would move this year um, with the students. And I really like the idea that they would have each other, that the um, students would have teachers, even if it wasn't their own teacher, that they would be in the building and there would be familiar faces. And I, I really want, um, I really hope that the school board will keep in mind what the transition will be over the next couple of years um, and what viability the, um, the schools have to function well and to continue to function well. I really support Rhett's ideas about an after school program at Roxbury, if that's at all feasible, and keeping that building open for planning year. And I appreciate the um, Roxbury parents coming to the realization that that might be a viable option to seriously consider. So I just asked the board to consider what is actually better in the long run um, and how will it be better next year and how will the budget be passed next year if too big a hole is dug. Thanks, Brad. Uh, we have uh, Chad Simmons. Thank you again, everyone. Uh, it's been Thank you again, everyone. Uh, it's been a really informative and I would uh, add emotional um, conversation. So I, again, I just want to share my appreciation for all the work that's gone in and the thoughtfulness that's gone in. I'll just add a couple of things um, from what I said before and, and, and echoing a lot of what's been said in the room already. Um, I really think we do need to uh, look at the equitable solution in terms of how this will impact families and in learners, um, I, I I really applaud and um, want to advocate for that creative, curious solution of looking at what uh, a slightly more um, a slightly higher um, tax rate would look like, like a sixteen percent. I think was mentioned. I would like to see that those options considered, um, and give uh, our communities another year to figure out how um, a step down, what a step down would look like. Um, and to, uh, Caitlin talked about the housing impact. Um, uh, I, I work in, a, my job is affordable housing. Um, our family was able to to buy a house in Montpelier. I should, I should start off by saying, um, I have a, a third grader at UES and uh, I just put her down to sleep and told her, you know, what this looks like for kids her age who are having to contemplate and families having to contemplate going to another school. And um, our family really can't afford uh, increased property taxes, but I think we can um, as, an, as a community, um, and thinking about this as a community, an active community. Um, so I would, um, again, echo um, what others have said is kind of encourage our advocacy up, not just to the legislature. I heard a lot of energy go towards the legislature, and I think that is a great avenue. Um, I know Jay's in the room. I know Kate and Connor have been active in these conversations. So talking with our legislative um folks about the impact and seeing if there's creative solutions in the next couple of months. Um, but I do want to advocate for um, some more time and a longer runway and um, agree with a lot of what's been said in the room. Thank you. And Melissa Stark. Can you hear me? Uh, yes. Okay, thank you. Um, I spoke last time. I have a uh, second grader at RVS. I also have a fifth grader at MSMS. I can say unequivocally that the relationships built with the families at RVS are the only reason the logistics of sending Roxbury students to Montpelier is possible. 
without those relationships formed with the children when they're at RVS and the parents is the only way we can make the uh, tenable bus scheduling and the bus route that we all agree does not work um, to make it work for our families is because of that support system. I also think that the transition that we allow for our fourth graders to have um, between RVS and MSMS, inclusion of the UES kids, takes months um, of planning and every year it's evolving to make it better. Um, and I agree wholeheartedly that that still has to continue. However, the time frame given right now to do that for kindergarten through third graders, who there is no plan in place. Something that we have evolved for years on making it a, the best opportunity for our fourth graders, we would not afford to our kindergarten through third graders. And that's extremely unfortunate, especially trying to explain to my second grader why he can't go to that school anymore. Um, I was humbled when I came to this district as my daughter was a kindergartner. We live almost on the Northfield border. I sent her to Northfield Preschool. Logistically, it worked for our family. I sat in front of this board when the only member there, still there is Jim, and pleaded for my daughter to go to Northfield, not Roxbury, because it didn't work for our family, and I had not heard good things about the district. Granted, the merger was happening that year. She's a fifth grader now. I'm not the person standing before you saying I'm going to take my child and go to Mont go to Northfield. My daughter is not necessarily, I wouldn't say thriving at Montpelier, but she's learning her way. It is this, uh, it's been a long road since September when she uh, arrived, but she's slowly gaining ground. I can't imagine what it would do to my next year third grader. The humble opportunity to RVS and realize on the first Thanksgiving, we used to have an all um, family Thanksgiving in that little room that you're in. Um, and having Tina stand up and tell all the families in very more eloquent words than I can say, if you family who was receiving uh, your holiday meal or your gifts or your gift cards that were going to make your holiday season a little easier for your family, they were available out front. This community, when I realized two thirds of our families were picking up those bags and leaving our school, was humbling to me to realize that as a middle-class family, I'm the minority in that school with those kids. And I don't mean that in any context of uh, putting down those families, they're doing what they can for them. Rushing the situation and forcing parents to come up with other alternatives, whether it's changing jobs, buying second cars, all the things I'm hearing from Montpelier residents about the increase to their taxes, ours went up as well. You're just passing the buck, unfortunately, onto these 36 kids or 42 kids worth of families to figure it out in a very short time frame. And we all know the bus doesn't work. 6.30 in the morning and 50% of those stops that that bus makes for RVS kids are not on the MSMS bus or Main Street High School bus that leaves Roxbury. You're adding 50% more stops to that bus, which takes time. So you're gonna take that 6.30 and push it back even farther for a kindergartner. That is just ridiculous in my mind that we would think that one bus in this budget, if we were to close Roxbury would work, and that is extremely short-sighted. Thank you. I think that is the end of the public comment. Um, in terms, first, first of all, I want to thank everyone for uh, for both showing up and for speaking very eloquently to a lot of really complicated and very difficult uh, situations. As, as, uh, I think helped us all. Um, and obviously, it's going to be a very, very tough decision, um, but this this input is helpful, and uh, we have a short period of time, obviously, to do this and get it. But you know, taking taking the time to, to be here late tonight and to hear from everyone is 
very helpful, and I know that fan is probably not helping with the audio. Um, um, I think in terms of next steps, what I've heard is we want to probably have a representation of what we got. It sounds like we want a 16 to 17% scenario with a large amount of fund balance used to get there. Also shown, mapped out, because two or three members have expressed a desire to at least see that. Um, and then maybe also build into one of the 13, 14% the cost of an after school program at RVS with moving the K through four to RVS. Does that sound right in terms of what we want to see on the 20th? That would already be in there. That it's would be what the 14% okay. represents. Okay. Um, um, I, I, I feel, I feel, want to just mention that looking at option one on the 14, on the 13% increase and option two, it, it kind of looks like it says, if you get your school, we won't bus your kids back from Montpelier. If it's if it's a, if it's an either or, and I don't think it's an either or, but maybe I misunderstood. Which one are you looking at, Rick? The or the fourteen percent increase eliminate PM busing and RVS. That was from Montpelier to Roxbury. Those two things aren't together; they're separate options. Yeah. So okay, gotcha. So you, the school is here. But there's no bus home from here, not from there. Right. Okay, I'm sorry. I, yeah. I was trying to ask about that earlier, and I didn't understand. I, and I, it felt like that wasn't, that didn't seem right. So no. I, I'm sorry. No. I apologize. And, and I will tell you one thing that at least I'm very committed to. Yeah. You know, re regardless of, you know, if, if we do end up moving K through 4 from Roxbury to UES, we will spend the next several months we've got a committee set up ensuring that we do everything we can to make transportation as easy for those kids and to make the integration as easy for those kids. I mean, that will be the highest priority, at least of, of me and I think of, of the committee we set up if that ends up happening. And if that ends up happening a year down the road, that will also be, you know, I think a, a high priority because I, I hear you on transportation. I mean, there is a reality of living in a rural place that, that you're going to have longer bus times, but we need to make that as safe and easy as we practically can. To that end, I'd like to add, um, you know, in, in the new numbers that we see next week, what it would look like to add an additional AM PM bus that comes out to Roxbury. 75,000. 75,000. Sure. Okay. So if we were to send two buses to Roxbury, both East Roxbury Central, West Roxbury Central, something like that, that it's seventy-five thousand dollars per bus. Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, well, thank you, everyone. Um, can I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Great. Aye. Thank you. We'll. I'm sorry about that.